Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Oh. I was hearing YouTube. I was like, that's weird. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you everyone to coming to yet another online edition of the Game Accessibility Conference. Although I'm bummed that I don't get to see everyone in person today, I'm still excited that we are able to be with you in at least a virtual format. So a couple of things before we get started today. I first want to recognize Happy Thanksgiving to all of our Canadian friends. Obviously, when Ian and I scheduled this as uh, an American and Eng Englishman, we did not uh, realize that we had booked on top of it. So thank you for all of you who are able to make it with us live or for all of you watching on the video afterwards because you're spending time with your families today. I hope that it is an absolutely amazing holiday for you. Now, it's also another holiday. And here in the US, it's actually a special one. Today is Indigenous Peoples Day, and this year is the first year Indigenous Peoples Day has ever had a presidential proclamation. As President Biden said, for generations, federal policy systemically sought to assimilate and displace Native people and eradicate Native cultures. Today, we recognize Indigenous people's resilience and strength, as well as all the immeasurable positive impact they have made on every aspect of American society. Today, the Game Accessibility Conference is being broadcasted from the uh, native and, and sacred lands of the Coastal Salish people, particularly the Snoqualmie tribe. It's important to us to acknowledge that we are on this land and in, like most cases in America, this land was not given up freely. If you can take the time, if not today, then this week, I highly encourage that you are able to go out and play games by indigenous developers or at least find games that tell indigenous stories. We can help the First Nations people of our land by listening to them. And again, today, we would like to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day for everything um, they have done and gone through. Now, moving more on to the exact conference details itself. So a few things to know. Here on Zoom, this is the primary place to watch. You will get the most customization options for the best accessible experience. Now we do have YouTube as a backup. And honestly, if you can't watch us live, YouTube is a great option because it allows you to rewind. But Zoom is the place to be. Now for chatting, don't chat in Zoom and don't chat in the YouTube chat. We actually request that you send all of your chatting over to Discord. That is where we will be having all of the conversation. You're gonna see a lot of channels happening in there. We have one channel for each talk where you will be able to interact with the speaker and get all of your questions answered. We also have channels for introducing yourself, uh, business needs, but even goofier stuff like food and pets. And if you've spent any time at the previous online editions of this conference, you know that we love sharing jokes, having a good time, and you can get in on this too. Even two of our emojis, at least two, <laughs> uh, the Battenberg and the Goblin, were directly results from chat that was happening in the Discord during talks. So please feel free to have a little fun with it. I do ask that you do stay on topic in the individual chat rooms. If not, you'll probably get a slight nudge from our moderators to take it into the appropriate channel. Now, I will say Ian and I were talking about this and being at this event is, um, it's still amazing for us. So we decided we wanted to tell you a story. So the Game Accessibility Conference isn't the first event that Ian and I have tried to run together. So many years ago, um, back at 2015 at GDC, we decided that we were going to have a social event. And so we actually went and hired a small bar, um, the Raven Bar in San Francisco, 
to allow us to reserve a back room and have uh, drinks and allow people to come and, and network and um, you know really get to chat with other accessibility experts. So we ended up working out a deal um, where we would get to the room for free as long as we hit a minimum bar spend. And we were really excited and we stuck up the uh, event on uh, Eventbrite actually and marked it for free. We were really excited. This was my cat Leon. I mean, we had over 150 people sign up. So we thought this was going to be a smashing success. The day of, however, um, about 10 people turned up. Uh, and three of those were um, me and Ian and my husband. So it turned out almost everyone who registered was doing the usual, you know, GDC thing where everyone just signs up for every event just in case they decide to go. Um, and they decided they didn't actually want to come to ours. But one of the things that we had done that carries on to this conference today was the quote slides that we had up on the TVs and the bars rotating or uh, through tons of different impactful quotes about gaming with a disability or accessibility and its impact. And we had that running and the manager of the bar had been reading the quotes throughout the night and he got a good understanding of what the event was and realized that it was really something that he wanted to support. And he decided it was for a good cause, which was really good for us because after we got to the end of the night, we were nowhere near the minimum bar spend. And so he let us off the hook. Um, you know, Ian and I would have had to figure out how to pay $1,500 out of pocket otherwise. So that's amazing when we come to today, uh, because after that moment, Ian and I decided we would never have another event without sponsors. And just knowing of the sponsorship lineups that we have today um, makes us incredibly excited. So uh, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Can you? Yes, Leon. Do you wanna thank our sponsors too? Do you think without them, this conference wouldn't be doable? Is that accurate? Oh, you're such a well-rounded cat. Anyway, so starting off with our gold sponsors, we would like to thank Microsoft, Ubisoft, PlayStation and Naughty Dog, and Square Enix. Without our gold sponsors in particular, we wouldn't be able to offer events like this for free. We would also like to thank our silver sponsors, the Entertainment Software Association, Riot Games, and Player Research. And then again, our bronze sponsors, Read Speaker AI, Descriptive Video Works, DigiPen Institute of Technology, who has tried to support us uh, before, but thanks COVID, and of course, Shara, the collective of gamers who spent too much time with me who decided to donate money towards this event. And now that I've gotten out of the way, the sort of run of the business for the conference, we're gonna kick this morning off the same way we always do, by having uh, Ian give us the latest updates on all things happening in the game accessibility world since our last conference. And with that, I will kick this off if my cat lets me. Hello, I'm Ian, Tara's co-conspirator for the event. And when I'm not doing that, I am an accessibility specialist with a background in design and UX before that. I'm going to kick things off the same way I always do with a um, little look back at some recent news. Some of the nice things that have been happening in the game accessibility world since our last event back in April. It's been a busy six months or so, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a highlights reel covering these areas. Hardware, information both for gamers and for developers, events, progress in the games themselves, people, and lastly, awards.
So first up, advances in hardware. We've had more progress at platform level. So Xbox and PlayStation building upon the great work they did with the launch of their new platforms. Now going further with efforts to add things like Xbox's chat transcription, quick settings menu and visual filters, and the PlayStation 5's Zoom functionality. And new hardware devices too, like the Praetorian Game On 1, which is a system that allows, amongst other things, eye gaze on Xbox. The arm cycle controller. This is a tiltable cycle interface with cycling mapped to regular controls. This is designed as a way for people with spinal cord injuries to be able to exercise through mainstream gaming. And the accessible cockpit. This is a super accessible Microsoft flight simulator setup in Israel that is seeing great application for occupational therapy. And there's a good lesson in here too. All of these fancy bits of kit I've been talking about just map to regular controls. So for game developers, rather than designing for the hardware, it's about us designing for the people who use it. Designing for the full breadth of human capability, as opposed to just supporting some bits of tech. And last is a favourite of mine, the Surface Adaptive Kit. This is a set of tactile bump labels, keycaps and port labels, together with some other add-ons to make manipulating laptop lids and stands easier. This builds upon the great work on and learnings from both the Xbox Series X and the Xbox Adaptive Controller, including its packaging. And it will make a tremendous difference to the experience of many gamers. So why am I such a fan? Um, first, because it's such a beautifully simple, elegant idea, but also it costs £15. Pounds. So I don't know what the USA price will be for it yet, but £15 pounds is around $20. That is the kind of assistive technology pricing that I like to see. Information. Firstly, information for developers. We've had EA open up their own internal information publicly through their patent commitment. So this means that they are sharing their patented accessibility solutions with the wider community free of charge for free usage. We've had training and guidelines being made for creation tools like Roblox and Unreal. We've had PlayStation sharing their internal inclusive language guide. We've had the IGDA Accessibility SIG uh, launching their new Accessibility Top 10 guidelines. And we've had South Korea launching a government initiative to produce their own state-backed guidelines. And we've had a lovely little video series of 60 second accessibility tips from many cats. We've had this, which is Dev Kit, produced by Special Effects. This is a really lovely set of guidelines on motor accessibility, which has been informed by the team's many years of experience working directly with disabled players. The guidance is spread across seven topics covering both interaction and gameplay, with each guideline accompanied by a series of detailed video tutorials.
And in the past six months, there have been multiple developer resources coming out of Xbox. This includes the Gaming and Disability Experience Guide, which is a complementary supplement to their accessibility guidelines, reorganising them by disability type. And a reference called Understanding Function to Design for Disabilities, which is what this screenshot is of. This is a really fantastic document that outlines how the various types of impairment work and how they relate to the demands that technology presents. And finally from Xbox, and this is a big one, the announce of the Gaming Accessibility Fundamentals Learning Path. This is an accessibility training programme providing a thorough introduction to accessibility through a set of several modules. These cover a bunch of things, including basic understanding of mechanics and barriers, the importance of directly involving the community and the practicalities of how to go about that. It covers an overview of hardware and software assisted technologies, it covers the advice within the Xbox Accessibility Guidelines. And lastly, it has a module for gaming hardware developers and designers who are looking to create more accessible devices. And this covers both uh, bespoke approaches like the Xbox controller, and also just how to make general purpose devices more accessible by default. The course launches later this month it will be available to everyone and it will be completely free. And of course, a vital source of information for developers is players. Efforts here have grown too with companies like Xbox, Rare and Raven, both adding to and expanding feedback systems for players to raise issues through. And the flip side of that is, of course, information for gamers. And we've seen some really great steps here too. Xbox and PlayStation have both established permanent accessibility showcases in their respective stores. We've also seen the addition of accessibility search and filters on the family video game database website. And Dagas just launched the Accessible Games database. This is a similar kind of initiative. It's aimed at enabling informed purchase decisions through cataloguing accessibility functionality across a wide range of games, and then letting gamers browse them through filterable lists like what you can see on the screen here. And last, but by no means least, Xbox launched a range of filterable accessibility tags directly within the Xbox Store. This is really fantastic, and not just for players, for developers too, because it means extra discoverability, new ways for your product to stand out and be found amongst a crowded marketplace. This is something that people have been calling out for for years and years and years. So it's really great to see progress being made on this. And one last point on information. We've had a whole bunch of new data. So I'm going to bombard you with a whole bunch of numbers now. 66% of gamers are more likely to play games that are more socially responsible. 30% of gamers in the USA and 20% of gamers in the UK identify as disabled. 7.6 million of Germany's gamers are disabled, 10% of whom use assistive devices. Now, 
the number of gamers aged 55 to 64 has grown by 32% in three years. Are developers incorporating accessibility into their games? 31% say yes, 42% say no, 27% don't know. That's actually an improvement on where things were the previous year, but it is clear that we still have a very long way to go. Naughty Dog shared that 9.5 million Uncharted 4 players played with an accessibility option enabled. Ubisoft shared data on audio description. Year one of their audio description effort resulted in 56 trailers being described for blind viewers. And we've had data on representation of disabled characters as well. So from a really significant data set of 27,000 characters across 10,000 minutes of stream gameplay, the number of characters that were shown with a physical disability was 0.1%. 0.1%. And of those 27,000, the number that they found with cognitive or communication disabilities was zero. So keep that in mind for when you watch the panel on representation tomorrow. So I know that was a pretty big and vast barrage of loads of numbers, but again, at the end, I will give you a link to all of those figures um, together with links to the actual studies that they're from as well. We've had lots happening in the events space too. General industry events being made more accessible. So this is events like the Summer Games Fest, the Age of Empires preview event, the Xbox and Bethesda Showcase and Ubisoft Forward, all adding things like sign language and audio description. What you're looking at here is a trailer from the Bethesda event being shown with captions and with ASL interpreting. The interpreter here on the right is actually the always awesome Brad Galloway um, from GameCritics.com. And a quick bit of trivia for you, he is an early pioneer in accessibility. Game critics actually started routinely including accessibility information in their reviews 20 years ago, all the way back in 2001. We've had development events like the Games for Change Student Accessibility Challenge, like the Sumo Digital One Button Game Jam for special effect, and the Boundless Game Jam. And tournaments for disabled gamers, like the Neat Mario Tournament, like the FIFA Xbox Invitational, like the Special Olympics Gaming for Inclusion Tournament, and the Adaptive Esports Tournament from Logitech and Able Gamers. And other types of events too, like Everyone Games, which was a new online conference and streamer event focusing on blind and low vision accessibility across both tabletop and digital games. PC Gamer held an accessibility week. This was a whole week dedicated to accessibility journalism from across the industry. And a personal favourite, which was held by Xbox for Global Accessibility Awareness Day back in May. They held a dedicated storefront promotion showcasing games that had accessibility wins at awards. So specifically, these were games that, that won at the Can I Play That Awards, the Dakers Awards and the Game Awards.
which takes me neatly on to the games themselves. Now, normally when I give a news update kind of talk, I reel off a long list of games that have been doing cool things. And that just isn't possible anymore. Now the list is just too long. So I'm just going to name a few particular favourites for you to check out. And if you do want a larger list, then again, there'll be a link to that at the end of the talk. So at the moment, we are still in the immediate aftermath of The Last of Us 2. And because of the development times um, involved in making games, it will take another year or two for the impact of that game on other studios to be fully felt in games hitting release. But the momentum that has been building in AAAs over the past couple of years has continued to build. In particular, with games like Ratchet and Clank and Far Cry 6, in some ways surpassing things that Last of Us 2 achieved. And you'll hear a bit more about both of those games over the next two days. There are lots of other AAAs who have been doing good things too, from Biomutant to Returnal, from FIFA to Psychonauts 2, from New World to Life is Strange True Colours. So it really is at a point now where you simply cannot release a AAA game without having a solid accessibility foundation. You can't afford to be that far behind what all of your contemporaries and competitors are now doing. Player expectations have now shifted too far. And with the kind of things that are currently in development, that is only going to increase. And indies have been knocking it out of the park in greater numbers than ever before, in no small part thanks to the continued influence of Celeste and its progeny. So just a few that I'd recommend checking out are Chicory, Horror Tales The Wine, Sunblaze, Twilight Drive, The Big Con, Severed Steel, Skatebird, Rainbow Billy, Unsighted and The Veil. Again, there'll be a link at the end with not just these, but many others too. And if you want to up your accessibility game, I can't recommend highly enough that you check out the indie scene. They are really acing it, not just in volume, but in creative, innovative approaches too. And if you are an indie yourself, make the most of the advantages that you have. Your ability to react quickly to feedback and engage directly with the community. To have full control without the huge legacy tech dependencies, without swathes of politics and internal advocacy to wade through. You are in a really wonderful place to drive the industry forward. And it's much easier to do than you might think. There has been an uptick in the number of older games receiving accessibility patches too. So games like World of Warcraft, like Sea of Thieves, State of Decay 2, Dead by Daylight, Among Us, Gears 5. And finally, finally, we are seeing progress on the really old games, like Zool Redimensioned and Diablo 2 Resurrected. Remakes and remasters have often been a black hole for accessibility, really just focusing on updating the aesthetics, which is a crying shame. Because there are two main goals of re-releasing an old game, right? Firstly, you want to broaden the demographic, attract new players into the franchise. Secondly, you want to make another sale to original players. These are players who are now much older, who might have very different capabilities to when they originally played. So you cannot 
do a good job of meeting either of those goals unless you are considering accessibility. And the fact that this is now starting to happen makes me very happy. And so does the wording of this announcement about Diablo 2. Hell welcomes all. And none of this progress is happening by accident. It's all down to people. And that includes the expansion of the industry's headcount of people in dedicated full-time accessibility roles. Recently, we've had our very own Tara moving over to Xbox Studios as their accessibility lead. Caitlin Jones, James Berg and Elizabeth White, as I'm sure many of you know, have been doing great things for a long time at Microsoft and EA and Bethesda respectively, but they have now all moved into permanent, dedicated game accessibility roles. James and Elizabeth are in accessibility user research and Caitlin as a program manager. And we've also had Joe Baker joining Xbox again as an accessibility program manager. Not shown here is Billy Gregory because he is not working directly on games, but I'm going to give him a shout out anyway. He is an absolute star of the web accessibility world who recently joined Ubisoft to head up accessibility across their many websites and apps. And this talk of people brings me on to the last area, which is awards. The kind of progress that I've been covering in this talk is being recognised. That explosion of new accessibility awards that we saw over the end of 2020 and into the start of 2021 has continued. We've seen accessibility categories added to a whole bunch of other accessibility award ceremonies. We've seen it added to the New Zealand Game Awards with a new category, which was won by a game called Trigger Witch. At the Game Audio Network Guild Awards, won by The Last of Us 2. And at a new award ceremony called the IRL Awards, that was won by three people, by Stacey Rebecca, by Doug Pennant, and also special effect. And there are two others in particular that have really stood out for me. Firstly, the Australian Game Developer Awards. So for this year, they added a category for accessibility innovation, which was won by a really lovely game called Unpacking. But they also have accessibility as a criteria on all of their other categories. So, for example, if you want an award for your visuals, the judging takes into account how those visuals are for people with things like colour blindness and low vision as well. And secondly, the IGDA Awards. This was a new award ceremony established this year. It's voted for by developers across the whole of the IGDA membership. And what makes this award unique is that the awards list individual team members who contributed. So the Accessibility Award was won by Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And what you're looking at here is individuals who helped that happen. which is great to see in itself, but it is also a great illustration of how much of a team effort accessibility is across all disciplines. But the progress that we're making isn't just about team efforts within studios. It's about the team effort across the industry, pushing each other forwards, learning from each other, sharing, collaborating. And that's what these couple of days are all about, both in the talks themselves and in the conversations and the connections happening on Discord. 
And that's the thought I'd like to leave you on. So there is just one last thing from me, which is that link that I promised with those longer lists in. And that is at tinyurl.com slash GA News dash OCT 2021. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of the event and I will see you on Discord. So a couple of things that I realized, number one, I didn't introduce who I was <laughs> before the conference started. I got so excited, I just dove right in. So hi, my name is Tara. Um, if you've met me, I'm the co-conspirator along with Ian for this conference. As Ian called out in that presentation, I am now the Xbox Game Studios Accessibility Lead. There's some questions on how you pronounce my name. Is it Tara? Is it Tara? Look, I'll respond to either. But what I know is uh, I have a, a sign name and my sign name is like T, but like you pop it like champagne because as the bar story signified earlier, um, I enjoy a good drink with friends. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Brittany, whose sign name is not for beer despite how her girlfriend signs it. <laughs> Um, the other thing I want to call out is there are some other awards that happened that Ian didn't acknowledge. Oh, what? what's this one? Is this the TIGA Di uh, Diversity Award for the Game Accessibility Conference? Oh, what's this one over here? Is this the Can I Play That uh, Most Accessible Streamed Event Award? Oh, wow, it is. Um, I, I just wanted to take a moment to say that Ian and I were so thankful to receive these awards. Uh, it means a lot to us to be recognized for all of the work that we have put into these events. So thank you for everyone who nominated us, who voted for us. And please, if you have any ideas on how we can make this even more accessible and inclusive, you know, please let me know. Uh, so we are going to be taking a short break for the morning so you have a chance to stretch your legs get another cup of tea and get ready. And we will be back at 9.50 with Unveiling the Veil. I will see you then.
All right, I hope everyone had a nice little break. So we're going, going, we're going into our next talk. Following Squirrels the Veil, Shadow of the Crown started out as a means to create an affordable, affordable narrative experience, but quickly became an endeavor to make a high quality, accessible and equitable gaming experience for blind, low vision and sighted gamers alike. Learn how this team got from point A to point B, their struggles and lessons along the way, and what exactly Falling Squirrel would like to do in the future. Hi there, uh, this is Unveiling the Veil, and my name's Jamie Robaz. And I'm Dave Evans, and we're with uh, Falling Squirrel, and uh, what are we going to talk about? Uh, our audio uh, game, The Veil, Shadow of the Crown. It's a all-audio uh, adventure game, and today we're presenting to talk about ways that you can use audio to strengthen the narrative of an interactive project and why it's valuable, uh, to advocate for the creation of more audio-focused and blind accessible game content, uh, and to give you a behind-the-scenes look at developing The Veil so you can know some of the trials, tribulations, and success that we ran into along the way. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about The Veil, Shadow of the Crown. Uh, it's an action adventure game with RPG elements. Uh, it's five plus hours of gameplay. Uh, completionists probably takes you seven plus. Uh, there's also difficulty levels, so if you're playing on really hard, uh, it could actually take you, I think, as much as eight, nine hours. Uh, it's audio-based combat and exploration is the, the, the main uh, aspects of the game. Um, we focused on uh, quality of uh, voice performance um, and we wanted to create an emotional engaging story and it's fully blind accessible. Those are some of the features and uh, we're just going to play a trailer followed by a little section of combat to just to give you some sort of uh, grounding as to what this game is as we talk more about it. And in order to best experience the game, we recommend that you put on a pair of headphones as the game uses binaural audio. Any set of stereo headphones will do, uh, so we'll give you a few seconds to grab those before we hit play here. Perfect. And here we go. Escort the blind girl 500 miles down a treacherous valley in the wake of an invading horde. Not sure what reward would be worth that. Pirates. Coming aboard. The shades were fortunate to gain hold over such a creature. <laughs> Alex, your weapon. It's on fire. I know you can use the damn thing. That swinging girl. <laughs> In the dark, you shine, Alex. Every one of us serves the Fae. Whether we know it or not, I will not serve them. That is why you must die. Adriana told me you were coming. A blind princess, doomed to watch her kingdom burn. If you want the kingdom, you will have to take it from me yourself. One second born to another, it's not an easy thing, being in someone's shadow. I like the shadows. Oh, the clansmen again. Myra, and they're coming this way. Use your fire. It may scare them off. This is as good a time as any to put your new powers to use, Princess. Remember, you need to build favor with the Fey Realm before you can bring the fire. Fire! 
So why did we make the veil? Uh, yeah, the, the veil was uh, a started with an idea that I wanted to make an audio-based game, basically so I could, as an indie developer, uh, tell a bigger story. Uh, one of the things I was doing in AAA was uh, directing voice actors uh, and also uh, writing narratives. So those were the obvious strengths uh, that would connect to a game like this. Yeah, and uh, as we uh, started doing market analysis uh, in pre-production, we realized that there were a number of similar games uh, that were uh, all audio or audio based that were really popular with the blind and low vision community, uh, and that there was a large demand for uh, a high quality game that was well made and well developed. Uh, and also we felt that if we made a game that was uh, well made enough that that novelty would extend past the blind and low vision community and be uh, of interest to a mainstream sighted audience as well. Yeah, and binaural audio uh, plugins were readily available at the time we started looking into this game uh, because of VR. So we got, got to take advantage of some uh, cool new technology. And uh, as we were uh, doing our pre-production uh, and our early play tests, uh, initially we started working with uh, Martin Corcellus as our uh, consultant for the blind and low vision community. Uh, and we quickly started working with the Canadian National Institute for the Blind as well. Uh, and we immediately found that everybody that we worked with uh, was very engaging, passionate, uh, welcoming, uh, and that there are a diverse uh, amount of people either with uh, uh, different um, uh, accessibility issues uh, or uh, different perspectives on what they wanted in a game. And uh, we were able to, I guess, classify a few different types of players when testing in the blind low vision community. So first off, there were uh, completely beginner uh, players, people who didn't even consider video games as a relevant medium to them uh, because of the accessibility barrier. Uh, these players had a lot of issues uh, with input devices whether it was keyboard or a controller. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure, uh, uh, especially when we were using a controller, that uh, the way that people we were playing the game uh, was accessible. We found that using uh, the uh, triggers and bumpers and sticks were a lot easier to engage with than face buttons uh, when you have no visual awareness of your controller. Uh, so uh, it was really good to get that perspective. Uh, for intermediate players, these would be people who uh, had a lot of experience playing audio games uh, and were pretty passionate and well-versed in the types uh, of audio games and the mechanics that were used there. Uh, these people were able to give us uh, a lot of variety in terms of what they expected based on what already existed uh, in the market and so far. And then we had our hardcore players. These are easily our most demanding players uh, in the blind low vision community, people who had played everything that that was available that was accessible uh, had really really strong opinions about how hard they wanted the game to be and they wanted it to be very hard uh, ha and challenged uh, our idea of um, you know what our game mechanics were going to be in comparison to what mechanics already existed in so far and we uh, kept coming back to the, this community or these communities over and over again to make sure we were meeting all the different types of players, uh, not only in terms of accessibility, but also in terms of just making uh, an enjoyable experience and one that was equitable both uh, to uh, the mainstream game community and blind and low vision players. Uh, while we were demoing our game, uh, we also ran into some unexpected issues that we would have to tackle. Uh, if your game has no visuals um, and uh, there's a lot of background noise in your venue, it's hard to attract people to it. Uh, it's also really difficult when somebody's standing there playing your game with no visuals to tell what uh, the player is doing and to be able to get feedback from them. Uh, what we ended up doing uh, is um, we would have an audio splitter and we would have a separate set of headphones so we could listen in on somebody playing the game. Uh, and we also came uh, prepared with a lot of pre-test and post-testing questions to make sure we weren't interrupting uh, anybody's engagement with with the game. Uh, because if players, uh, uh, you know, are have um, 
are fully invested in the game from an auditory standpoint and can't see you uh, uh, next to them while they're playing, uh, it can be pretty jarring to interrupt them from that experience. Um, when we were testing online, there were some technical issues that we had with screen readers, uh, and we needed to make sure people were either disabling or tuning their screen reader settings to work with the game. Uh, and same thing with some of the development tools that we were using, whether that was additional menus uh, that were for internal use. We want, would want to make sure the next time that we do uh, a project like this to be to develop those tools to be accessible from the ground up. Yeah, and one really cool thing uh, that we got to learn about was uh, we, we do have uh, several um, actors from the visually impaired community that provided voice work for the game, and we got to learn a little bit how to, to uh, record with them. Um, there's a few different techniques, but the one that um, we were introduced to was actors... Uh, uh, recording audio to direct playback in their ears. So they were listening to robot voice playback of the lines I'd written um, and they were saying the lines back pretty much as they're hearing them. Uh, we had to, of course, be careful for having some audio bleed between the headset and their voice and we had to make sure that we uh, had the robot voice stuff set up. So there's a couple things that uh, we were kind of instructed on how to, how to work but uh, the one thing, uh, the end result speaks for itself. They did a fantastic job and I was actually quite amazed actually that uh you could have a full realized performance while being fed lines in your ear um so it was a, it was definitely a new experience for me so from a production standpoint, making a game with no visuals is obviously very cost effective. Uh, without that whole pipeline of visual production, uh, you're able to cut down uh, on just about uh, every aspect of game development. Uh, also, um, we were able to quickly prototype scenes and narrative and parts of the game by using uh, Google text to speech um, that made uh, uh, workshopping different aspects a lot easier. Uh, in terms of uh, making a game that's accessible for the blind and low vision community, uh, there's a really high floor for sales for the game. We knew almost right off the bat that uh, uh, everybody who is already uh, interested in audio games was going to get our game uh, because there's such a high amount of demand and small amount of supply for other projects like this. Um, additionally, the uh, PR was really great. Uh, we had a bunch of content creators, uh, uh, game journalists, uh, shows, etc. reach out to us uh, and uh, get have their interest in our title. Um, and on the other side of that, uh, the blind low vision community from a, a number of different places, whether that was the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, uh, audiogames.net, uh, several different people that we've worked with independently, were all really welcoming uh, and were all really uh, engaging. Uh, people would seek us out to, to help us. People really uh, seemed to appreciate that we were making making this kind of game and that we all parties involved wanted to make it as uh, good as it could be. Um, oh, and the game's uh, novelty uh, was, was a big driver. So uh, there were, there were people that came to us that had no real uh, interest in talking about our game from the story of accessibility. Uh, they just had never heard of a game like this before. And even though it's, there's quite a few games like this in the blind community, maybe not the scale we're doing this, uh, this was still a novelty for a lot of gamers and uh, people who write about games. Um, so what creators love about this game? Uh, I mean, across the board, uh, a huge amount of creative freedom um, in the ability to uh, create a world that's really big and expansive and it's not, again, crazy expensive, but you can also make changes very easily. Um, so uh, the best example would be if I wanted to add a character uh, fairly late in the game, that's uh, a, a, a new dialogue I have to write, uh, and then uh, casting. Um, that's pretty much all that involves. Uh, we don't have to suddenly then model a character at the last minute. S same thing goes for uh, settings uh, and, and adding branches to the story. Uh, we could do those things relatively easily as we kind of uh, uh, created the game and got feedback from the community and also uh, took characters in different directions based on performances from our actors. So uh, normally you're kind of locked in because you've already made all those decisions. So I thought that was a huge, uh, awesome benefit of making a game in all audio. Uh, and the other thing, and I, I think we'll talk about this a little bit later too, is 
uh, combat and, and certain emergent events could happen kind of anywhere because there was no need for a specific transition um, because you can't see what's happening. You could very easily have a fight just happen in the middle of a blacksmith shop or while you're getting a quest, um, some crazy event could happen. Um, and we, we exploited those things uh, uh, throughout the game. Um, and lastly, uh, the game's incredibly immersive uh, and part of that comes from the fact that there's very few things that can take you out of the experience. So if I have a character that's standing right in front of me because the audio spatialization tells me they're standing in front of me and they're whispering in my ear and moving around me, if I were to do that in VR or to do that in a, 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 even a AAA experience, um, I'm going to have a model right here this close to my face and I'm going to be able to scrutinize the facial effects and the, the quality of the hair and, and, and textures and that sort of thing. And in this game, because I have my eyes closed, which is the way I play it, uh, it it's it's completely believable just with a, um, with a compelling actor involved. Yeah, and one of the things that I think we heard a lot uh, is that if you're an audio designer, this is basically a, a dream project uh, for you to run with. Yeah, because you know people are actually going to listen to your work for, for sure. So uh, when making the veil, uh, one of the pillars that uh, we had for our design philosophy was to make this as accessible as we could to as broad of a range of players. And as we touched on earlier, there are a lot of different types of players with varying levels of experience. So we wanted to make sure that explorable areas were all simple, that people weren't going to get stuck or be confused as to where they were, uh, even without any visuals. Uh, so that meant that we would make sure that uh, objects that don't have sound are never interfering uh, with objects or directives that do have sound. Um, for explorable locations, uh, we had clear beacons that were very unique, noticeable uh, audio cues uh, that pointed to points of interest. Um, and this way we were able to create things that had a shallow learning curve, whether that was in exploration or in combat, that still allowed a lot of depth for expert players. So not only was uh, uh, our difficulty um, did we use different difficulty settings to be able to make combat have a smaller or larger margin of error? But even in exploration, if you're listening carefully, there are some things that you could pick up on that were optional explorable locations, interactions with characters, or inventory items uh, that people who really listened would be able to hear and take advantage of. Um, we have a small video here we're going to play uh, that just shows you the difference between the in-game perspective on the right and the in-editor perspective on the left of exploring a town so you can get that kind of behind-the-scenes perspective. So you can see on the left, uh, the green squares are those audio beacons uh, in the circle with the cameras of the player moving. Here we are, the wandering goat. I'll assume it's an inn and not a stable. Um, so uh, the novelty of the game um, is ultimately its intimate feel. I kind of touched on this, uh, but uh, so, so places where this is um, really important um, in making the game not only novel but f feel great and sort of exp sort of justify why an all audio game might be a superior experience in some way. Uh, the close combat uh, was something that uh, was talked about by people who play the game as being pretty impressive. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, in combat, the subtle things matter, so the shifting of an enemy's weight or their footsteps on the ground and even what kind of ground they're walking on suddenly suddenly matters. Um, most of the combat is very close. It's part of the reason why we chose a, a medieval setting for our game, was that we'd have people wearing noisy equipment, plate mail, and that sort of thing. The players are also uh, awarded uh, or rewarded for listening to details in the soundscape. Um, so again, we didn't want general navigation to be frustrating because you wanted to get to, let's say, the blacksmith. So that's a very easy beacon to hear. Uh, but you might hear the whimpering of a dog in the corner. And if you sort of went over to explore what that is, you could feed him and he could become your companion in the game. So there's little details like that throughout the game that would reward you. Uh, and finally, uh, we could take um, things like uh, shops and tutorials and maps, these things that are often kind of systemized, 
Um, and, uh, or in the case of, let's say, um, inventory or shop, they become like a, a, just a menu screen with a bunch of um, uh, text on it. Uh, we were able to take moments like that. And because we were forced to work in audio and couldn't use any of those conventional um, sort of shorthand things like text, uh, we were able to make those into more narrative moments. So a uh, narrative moment could happen in the blacksmith shop. It feels more like you're bartering with someone or talking to them uh, rather than choosing a weapon. Uh, or in the case of uh, uh, selecting quests, uh, it feels like you're kind of talking to people uh, in a tavern and where, again, anything could happen. A fight could break out or something while you're simply getting a quest. Yeah, that was probably one of the most interesting and challenging parts of development is we wanted to cater towards making a game that felt like an equitable RPG or adventure game experience where you had the agency to make different choices that affected the gameplay uh, while also still maintaining that sense of immersion. We never wanted people to go through a series of menus with different stats, though we did include stats in our menus that you can optionally see. Uh, we still wanted to maintain that narrative flow. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> how did we succeed in this? Actually, we, we succeeded in a lot of ways, which is great. Uh, the game came out to, uh, re re um, not renowning, what's the, I'm making resounding? up words. Resounding, that's, that's the, the word. word. A resounding critical success, um, and uh, the community reception with the blind community was, was uh, uh, very, very positive. Um, uh, some of the things that uh, people talked about in terms of what they loved about the game. Uh, the audio design um, was uh, lauded. The music was lauded. Um, the uh, quality of the performances across the board uh, were really well received. Um, and uh, the, actually, I was a little surprised that the, the combat challenge and the amount, the fact that the amount of diversity in combat that we had from the beginning to the end of the game uh, carried the experience, which is five to seven hours. Uh, that was generally we we pulled that off, and I was that was probably my biggest concern going into this was that uh, because there was a certain amount of repetition and things you're doing, uh, but I think we changed up the scenarios enough that it ended up uh, feeling like it was different, quite different at the end that it was in the middle and the beginning, uh, and then uh, the narrative uh, in general was really well received. And one thing I, I want to call it in particular was that uh, we were warned uh, going into this by members of the blind community that. Uh, a sighted developer making a game in all audio uh, that features a blind protagonist who is exceptionally good at things. Uh, there's a, a huge trope uh, in doing that. Um, people within the blind community, uh, just like anyone playing a video game, wants to be transported into a different experience and to be then transported into the same experience every time you play an audio game, which is another blind character, is a trope. And the one thing uh, that uh, we strive for is that this character uh, the one one major warning we were told yes absolutely do this that's that's fine uh but make sure this character isn't uh, identified by or defined by their disability that there are many other things going on and very early on in the game there were two things we wanted to do and i think we succeeded at uh one was that you would forget about alex's blindness very quickly and you'd be playing a character that was again not defined by her blindness you became very comfortable with being her and closing your eyes and living in that experience. And the other thing was that I wanted her blindness to a certain extent, especially early on, to be an element of empowerment. Um, that it's just, uh, and, and really playing a game from a sighted person's perspective, um, being transported into an experience where you get to be um, elevated in some way. And uh, the fact that Alex moves around uh, spaces, big, huge, busy spaces, confidently, she doesn't bump into things. Uh, she is never, we're never reminded of her blindness because again, she's so confident in her movement. Um, this is the way m many people in the blind community live day to day. And that was something uh, that a, a lot of sighted people um, playing the game appreciated. And then again, because you're not forced to be re reminded of this constantly throughout the game and that she does evolve as a unique character, people from the blind community uh, were playing something different and challenging and new. 
and it wasn't just the same trope over again. So I think we got that fairly well. Yeah, in addition to achieving that balance uh, with the narrative and the tropes, uh, there was uh, a difference, I think, in expectations and reception between uh, a general audience and the blind and low vision community. So, uh, you know, there would be critics or players who would play the game and review it uh, and really appreciate it for the novelty. Uh, and we're really happy that uh, uh, we succeeded on that front. On the other hand, uh, there are a, a lot of people in the blind low vision community who were very experienced with audio games who were wary of uh, the mechanics in the veil being uh, um, you know, very similar, uh, if not the same as other games. Uh, like we said earlier, a lot of people called it a, a, you know, a whack-a-mole combat mechanic. Um, and uh, what we found is that even people who had those concerns still appreciated the way that we were able to uh, change up the formula. And Dave touched on it earlier uh, with the challenge and diversity in combat. By having uh, the player have agency through their ability to select different types of weapons uh, to use or spec into uh, the different magic attacks yeah. that we have. Em emergent moments like being pulled underwater or riding a horse and fighting from horseback um, or falling through a hole suddenly. Um, all these moments, sort of the sum of their parts, made each individual thing fairly unique, even though uh, we were coming back to this relatively straightforward mechanic of listening for things and striking out at them. Yeah, when you combine it with the the great quality of the writing and the performances and the, the sound design, some of the parts is, is a really good way to describe it. And we're really happy that everything could come together to be received so well by uh, a bunch of different players. Um, even though that is the case, there are still some things that we haven't quite figured out and some challenges that we have along the way. Probably the number one thing is uh, marketing and how to sell a game with no visuals. Um, when creating uh, a trailer um, for the game, uh, there were a lot of comments that we found where um, people were not clear uh, as to what the gameplay was. Um, I think it was for uh, um, uh, a Xbox uh, live stream event that we had where uh, a lot of the chat was remarking that we were showing our game but we weren't actually showing the game um, and in order to address that uh, we've found that you know having a really clear upfront description saying this is an all audio game there are no visuals um, is is a good way to do that but even for some people they'll skip right by that and just watch it and still be confused. So we've considered adding to the title of videos on YouTube or other places uh, that the game has no visuals and that might make it more to the point for people who are gonna skip. And for streaming, we always have to have something on the corner of the screen oh, saying yeah. what this game is, wear headphones. Um, again, because it is very confusing when you see a game that's basically a black screen. Uh, with some small particles. Yeah, for streaming and content creators as well, uh, we still don't necessarily have the answer is the best way to make it an engaging experience. With games that have a lot of visuals, it's easy to let the visuals kind of take the wheel while a streamer interacts with their yeah. audience. And, and the streamer can show their personality constantly by that interaction. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, in our game, they're just constantly stepping on the only thing that communicates as to what this game is. So you find yourself streaming. When we stream it, we're quiet. We have to be quiet a lot. Um, you know, the one joke I was going to set up on my stream is uh, just have a, a, a just a banner that says uh, this is this this is not a sleeping developer. This is someone playing an all audio game because basically that's what I look like. I close my eyes and I play this game. Yeah. Um, so I, we don't have a great answer for that. But if you have a great answer, yeah. we're happy to talk to you in Discord about it. Yeah. And then um, just through people playing the game, things that we either we knew we couldn't do because we couldn't afford to do it at the times. But um, we we did not. The game was not set up. The game was set up in 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 a way to be uh, played without interruption. So we didn't have any mechanics to allow us to skip scenes uh, or dialogue. And um, by the way, this was something that wasn't as apparent as a problem to me initially. I, I knew it was something we might be able to add later. Um, but what I hadn't considered, maybe stupidly, is that 
uh, people within the visual visually impaired community would play this game a lot. So I, I really did make this game to be something that was played once or maybe twice on a higher difficulty level because it's it's so narrative based um, that once you understand all the things that happen, there's less value to coming back to it. Uh, but people who don't have a ton of content to play are playing this game eight times. And at that point, it starts wearing thin <laughs> to hear the same dialogue over and over again. So uh, that's something we're looking into doing, but not something out of the gate we considered. Um, and uh, I, I guess you might want to talk about the other ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, just in terms of the depth of mechanics, um, you know, we would love to be able to make uh, gameplay additions. Uh, a, a number of people have requested sort of an endless combat mode or an arena mode, um, yeah, having more gear yeah. uh, and having more uh, narrative choices that, uh, as we touched upon earlier, I believe, um, you know, we started out with the Alex, uh, the main character, as kind of an empty shell, and you could make choices that would uh, have some effect on the narrative, and we dialed that back a little bit. So for another project, it might be neat to uh, have a, a bigger scope of narrative yeah. choice. And replayability is even more important within this community because of the lack of content. Um, and then finally, uh, we knew this was going to be the case, but the game's not... Um, accessible to the hearing impaired community. Uh, we realize there are things we could do to for people that have uh, certain aspects of hearing impairment, uh, maybe like more hearing in one ear or the other. There's certain things we could have added or probably still will add to the game to make that uh, easier because it is an audio experience that, some, that many people in a uh, hard of hearing community could potentially experience. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, outside of, um, I guess the other thing would be languages as well. Um, yep. we, we, and subtitles. Yeah, because the first thought in my mind was like, well, we can't afford to do more than English in terms of the uh, the performance, the acting and voiceover. Um, but there was an argument to be made to say, oh, there's people in other countries that know enough English to be able to play the game, but may want to much better understand what the story is saying, and we could have done subtitling. So th those are kind of, I'd say, borderline missteps to things that we kind of knew wouldn't be there for this game, because our focus was uh, a really English-speaking, um, uh, visually impaired community, what was the focus of this game. And going forward in the future, uh, we'd love to be able to make uh, um, either blind accessible modes or mods for pre-existing games. Um, and, uh, you know, porting of audio content podcasts uh, and audio or narrative heavy games to accessible interactive platforms would be really neat. Uh, for future titles, uh, I think one of the things that came up most in playtesting is uh, having some kind of player versus player game that uh, either is uh, devoid of visuals or has an equitable play experience for both sighted players that as a fully uh, visualized game uh, and people who are blind or low vision or choose to play without visuals playing in the same game experience against each other. Yeah. That would be, that would really be super neat. Yeah, I think from an immersion standpoint, I would love to make a game where you could play as a blind character and the visuals would be taken away from you. Um, but you could also uh, play as a sighted character and have those. And you could also be blind and play as a sighted character because the, the sighted character scenario would be 100% accessible. Yeah. Um, and then people in all communities, blind, low vision, hearing impaired, um, could, could all be playing this game together, which is sort of the ultimate goal when it comes to accessibility, that people can share these experiences and they're not limited to just one community to be able to share that, share that experience with. Right, and those experiences would have more dynamic combat options, a depth of mechanics, and the visuals would be equitable regardless of, of your uh, personal accessibility experience. Yeah. Um, also, a lot of people, uh, when hearing about the game, uh, touched on smart speaker games. Uh, and while it's something that we haven't really talked about much recently, it's still uh, a conversation topic that comes up a lot that we would love to touch yeah. upon. And, in the future. and beyond our company, the, the main thing I think about is, is all these uh, AAA games that have a huge amount of accessible content for the blind community. They have you know, millions of dollars are going into the music, to the writing. Um, into the dialogue recording um, and uh, hopefully finding ways to deliver more of that content to people because that's ultimately what people they want to be playing the biggest titles um, I, I obviously we've gotten some great feedback on 
on people playing a title that's broken a bit into the mainstream at the same time is for the blind community. Um, but they also want to be playing The Witcher. They want to be playing Call of Duty. Um, and, and that's where I'm hoping this is going uh, eventually. Yeah. I believe All that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, we're definitely hanging out in the Discord. So feel free to drop us a line and we'll be happy to chat with you. Uh, otherwise, thanks very much yeah. for uh, attending GA Conference and yeah. uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much for that amazing talk and sharing um, all of your learnings and your process. Obviously, the Discord has been hopping this entire time. Um, one of the things that I saw, and I absolutely love that Alex in the Discord said, the veil has been on my Steam wish list for ages. This is definitely pushing me to move it up to the top of my playlist. And of course, as a developer, I was super excited to literally see the top down view of how it was working in engine. It really helped me understand how you were building it and how it was working. And of course, I love talking about future improvements that could happen to the title, including making this amazing experience something that our deaf and hard of hearing friends and gamers would be able to play. But there was the one topic that's already come up twice today, the topic of representation, why it's important and how to do it correctly. So remember, we are going to have a panel just on that topic uh, tomorrow, I believe. So keep a look at. Now, if you are interested in learning more about the veil or seeing a live stream, um, on Thursday, October 14th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific time, in recognition of World Sight Day, Xbox Plays will host a stream featuring uh, content creator Sightless Combat, who is in the Discord, and he will be playing the Veil Shadow of the Crown on that stream. Um, that's part of the larger streamer takeover built uh, streamer takeovers for Disability Awareness Month. So you can catch that uh, at twitch.tv slash Xbox. So again, if you want to uh, hear more about the game and see what a live stream is like. With that, we are going to be taking our first uh, long break of the day because taking breaks is important. And we know that especially sitting at your desk all day watching the conference can be physically exhausting. So we are going to be taking just under a half hour break and I will see you in about 25 minutes at 10.50 a.m. Pacific time. So see you then and have a good break.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your break. I know that I did because I had a snack, which I posted in the snacks and beverage channel. And then, of course, Zach uh, saw my cheese puffs and raised me some delicious looking a s'more snack mix that apparently came from Costco. Um, also seeing lots of love in the pets channel. So if you need to see adorable cats, some beautiful corgis, you know where to go. Keep sharing all throughout the conference. We literally love to get this kind of stuff. It makes us so, so happy. Now, going into our next talk, accessibility in the metaverse. If we want the future of the internet to be for everyone, it follows that the, inno it, that the innovations we create must also be for everyone. At Roblox, this future is deeply rooted in the metaverse and the user-generated experiences within it. In this talk, we will explore how to approach accessibility in digital communities and delve into how Roblox is addressing this vital challenge across millions of immersive experiences, solving problems at scale, taking the long view, and educating our developers on best practices to integrate and ingrain accessibility across the platform. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining me today in Accessibility in the Metaverse. Today we will have a short introduction, then discuss Roblox's approach to both accessible user-generated content and first-party content. First, I'd like to introduce myself and talk a little bit about what we're doing at Roblox. Hello, my name is Andrea Fletcher. I am a white woman with brown hair wearing a black Roblox branded t-shirt. I am a software engineer on the social team at Roblox, and in my spare time, I love bringing my imagination to life through hobbyist development on our platform. Previously, I worked on the iOS accessibility team at Apple, and I interned on the accessibility team at Google in college. My love and passion for accessibility stemmed from a childhood interest in sign language that grew in college while working with a research team that focused on developing educational games for deaf children, helping them learn ASL. I attended GA Conf a couple years ago and was extremely impressed by the speakers and the content. And it's truly an honor to speak to you all today. So what is Roblox? Roblox is a platform that supports the creation of all kinds of 3D experiences. Millions of people around the world log on every day to do things like play mini golf, dress up their avatars, take care of their pets, and pretend to be dragons. We believe shared experiences enable you to build rich and meaningful connections with others. What we're working towards is the ability to connect billions of people digitally in a civil and positive environment. And that is our vision of the metaverse. The metaverse is a persistent digital space where people can learn, work, socialize, and play together. It's made up of experiences that are interactive, immersive, infinite, and in real time so people can feel like they're together even when they can't be. Here are some statistics that really drive home the scale of what we're doing. What I want to reinforce is the metaverse is made entirely by developers, more than 8 million of them. This is especially important when considering our approach to accessibility. That brings me to our next section, Accessible User-Generated Content, or UGC for short. A lot of our developers' first experience coding or building was when they opened up Roblox Studio for the first time as a kid. We try to make it really easy for anyone to open Studio and create something fun and exciting that they can then share and experience with their friends. Because of a lot, a lot of our developers are new to the world of development, we have an incredible opportunity and responsibility to teach them about accessibility at an early age and make a long-term positive impact on the industry as a whole. Roblox Studio is the IDE we provide to our developers to make content. It's free to use, it lets you create anything and release it with one click, smartphones, tablets, desktops, consoles, and virtual reality devices. 
And our developer hub is an integral part of how people learn how to develop and build on Roblox. The developer hub is the home to all of our API documentation, as well as tutorials and articles educating users on a variety of topics like monetization, cross-platform support, and localization. Shown here is a video of a tutorial we provide on our developer hub on pathfinding. You can see this character successfully navigate to their final destination along a path of bridges, thanks to the implementation provided in the following code snippets. And as of early this year, the Developer Hub also hosts an article on accessibility best practices. This article was written by yours truly in collaboration with the developer documentation team and currently covers five best practices about text, color, and sound. Here you can see two examples of UI showing the same information, but with two different treatments. And when shown with the blur effect, the second treatment with larger text is still legible. This tries to reinforce the idea of putting yourself in someone else's shoes when making decisions about UI. And here's the principle we use for, uh, here's the example we use for the principle, don't use sound alone to convey meaning. There's a character near a phone booth, and when the phone starts ringing, there isn't any indication other than the sound that it's ringing. Our character shrugs, not knowing what is going on. But the second time around, with a particle effect and a blinking light paired with the sound, our character knows to walk over and answer the ringing phone. We received a huge amount of positive feedback on this article from members of both the gaming community and the Roblox community. A few quotes I found really wonderful were, I'm excited about people getting a good grounding in accessibility years before they enter the industry. And Roblox is teaching accessibility. Knowing how much time my own kids are on the platform, this makes me smile. We're planning on expanding this article to include more best practices and examples over time. Having a single best practices article for accessibility is great, but accessibility touches so many different parts of development and tutorials aren't the most discoverable. So what we've started to do is document certain quantitative best practices in our API documentation. This is an excerpt of our documentation on UI text size constraint, which allows users to constrain how much text can grow or shrink when it's set to automatically scale based on its bounding box. We've added a small call out to the description of min text size, like we do for other kinds of recommendations, and suggest that this value not be set below 12 pixels. And this way we teach users about these quantitative guidelines and get them to start thinking about it in terms of Roblox properties and features. We also get an opportunity to link them to the accessibility best practices article, opening the door for users to learn more about accessibility if they want. I'd also like to mention the work that we've been doing in our accelerator program. This is a three month program where we work closely with a selected groups of teams and studios developing their pitched projects. During these three months, we have regular play tests, office hours and tech talks that cover a variety of topics like monetization, level design and UI. And now we include a one hour long session covering more than 20 gaming accessibility guidelines, along with examples from real Roblox experiences that do a great job in these areas. Shown is a photo of the slide deck from one of our presentations covering the specific volume, volume controls game accessibility guideline and an example from an experience in Roblox. The last thing I'd like to note in this section is that our community really cares about accessibility. Time and time again, I'm blown away by the compassion our developers have for each other, where they internally advocate for better accessibility and each other's experiences and act on that feedback. One developer went so far as to make a 10 page how to on game accessibility on our developer forum a few months ago. We wanna make sure to grow and foster that interest. And finally, I would like to talk about our first party content. Events have been something we've had on Roblox for a long time. For example, we have an awards show every year called the Bloxy Awards, where we recognize best in class experiences in a variety of categories, like best showcase, best use of tech, 
and user choice awards like favorite map and best trailer. This has evolved over time from a live stream video featuring Roblox employees as announcers to a fully immersive animated experience where users are taken on a journey through nominees experiences featuring a mocap concert intermission. And over the last two years, the frequency of these events has skyrocketed with persistent branded worlds, concerts, listening parties, and even book launches. Almost all of these events are created by the Roblox developer community. Videos have become a staple of our events. Almost every event we've had since 2020 has incorporated videos of some kind. And we're now supporting captions in these videos. Captions are locally toggleable for users, so you can use them based on your preference. Video frames are still in beta, and our first party experiences are the perfect opportunity for us to try out new features like this. Because we operate at such a large scale, first party support for captions immediately opens up experiences to easily support captions and the magnitude of millions in their videos, and it's something we're really excited to support. Voice chat is another extremely exciting feature we've recently started beta testing. It's currently totally spatial, meaning you can only hear people near you. This makes the metaverse feel so immersive, and it's been extremely fun seeing what our developers are doing, it, with, doing with it. Here's a short video of a theme park that enabled spatial voice, and you can hear the player on the roller coaster scream as they fly by. We're actively working on supporting speech to text and testing out features like live translation. We want Roblox to be a place where anyone can communicate with anyone else and solve real world communication problems, not extend them. And as a developer myself, I have been actively experimenting with ways to address complex game accessibility guidelines with solutions that are already supported by the tools provided to our developers. Here's an example of a demo I put together on how we could allow sounds to have associated icons or colors to ensure that any sound within earshot of the player also has an associated visual. Whether or not the, ob the object has uh, associated with that sound is on or off screen. The code is written in a plug and playable way and all it requires is a custom icon or color to be associated with each sound a developer uses in three dimensional space. This just goes to show with the tools provided, uh, a lot of this is already possible. And while working on our captions for our concerts, is also able to build a functioning SRT creator, allowing users to not only input their captions into videos, but provide an in-studio option to caption their own videos or proofread and edit generated captions is really exciting. And it aligns strongly with our vision of the metaverse. And that's the end of my presentation. Once again, I am so excited to be here, and this is just the beginning of what you'll see from accessibility in the Roblox community. If you have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A on Discord. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you so much for that talk. I love the both educating the content creators to educating content creators on how to create accessible experiences on their own. So as they're generating their fun, immersive gameplay that they can include other people. But honestly, just the fact that with the tools provided, a lot of this is already possible. Meaning if you just took a second to think about it, you already have what you need. Uh, sorry, I was just confirming. I still see the video on Zoom. Hmm. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. Wanted to pause and make sure it was still working. Of course, if you are having problems, there is YouTube as the backup. Now, uh, we're going to take a brief break uh, for about 10 minutes before we go into our next panel. We're doing a 10 minute break this time because the next talk is our longest talk of the day, uh, a full hour long. And as Navi, one of the panelists said, uh, Roblox has 
been the only way I've been able to keep in touch with my niece and nephew during the pandemic. They currently think I am very cool for speaking right after a Roblox developer. So we will see you in 10 minutes with that panel. Thanks.
I hope everyone had a good break and you are here for our longest talk of the day because there was honestly so much content and it was all amazing. So we're going into our panel and for us at GA Conf, it's really important that we allow people with disabilities to tell their own stories and their own challenges because they literally know best. So we were excited to have this panel of four experts in the space. So motor accessibility in gaming, the barriers we still face. Even with major strides that have been made in motor accessibility, those with motor disabilities still often face barriers. What are they? How can we make progress? Will we ever reach full inclusion? This panel will be tackling these topics and more. So with that, I'm gonna kick it off. This is the all-star panel that we have right here as we talk about motor accessibility and inclusion. Let's get a chance to meet each and every one of them. Erin, introduce yourself, my dear. Hello, everyone. I'm Erin Holy, and I have muscular dystrophy as well as anxiety. Um, right now, I work as digital content producer for Easter Seals, and I'm also an accessibility consultant, and I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. Erin, we are delighted to have you with us, my dear. I am honored to be in your presence. I just want you to know that. Navi, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little about yourself. Hi there. Yeah, my name's Navi. I play video games. <laughs> I have multiple sclerosis and a brain injury as well as a result of a massive ischemic stroke I had a few years back. Um, and that uh, means that I've come up against some barriers in the video games I like to play. So that's what brings me here today. I'm a digital accessibility specialist um, and I work on making video games more accessible for people with disabilities. Awesome. Navi, great to have you. I am honored to be in your presence as well. It's nice to be here. Thanks. Mike the Quad, my man. Mike, and you brought a companion along in the back too. Why don't you tell us about yourself and your companion in the back too? Well, let me go ahead and introduce. This is my service dog, Pixie, uh, first and foremost. Yep, she's looking over at me, sitting on the cat bed. Um, I'm Mike, Mike the Quad, on Twitch. Um, I'm a Twitch streamer. Uh, I'm a disability advocate for those who have spinal cord injuries, and I myself am a C6 quadriplegic. Um, and I'm just here to tell everybody about accessibility in video games. Hey, Mike, I am honored to be in your presence as well. I mean, being with fellow gamers, fellow disability consultants, game consultants, and uh, just ones who live the life that we live. It is so great to have you too. Well, uh, Mike, it really is. Thank you. All I'm right. Glad to be here. Let's do this. All right. So we have come a long way when it comes to gaming accessibility. I, I went back, uh, I know Aaron and I was talking about this. I go back to the Odyssey game. So I am like so old, a ColecoVision, all, all the above, Atari and things like that. And I became uh, disabled when I was, uh, I'll just say how many years ago, it was 28 years ago. So it wasn't a lot of options for me out there when it comes to, to gaming. But now we see this new innovation that allows us to game. And Aaron, I'll throw this uh, to you first. How do you feel about the strides that we have made when it comes to gaming? I feel like we've made so much progress, but at the same time, there's a lot to be done. And I feel like um, people think, oh, everyone's talking about accessibility. But that doesn't mean that we solved all the issues. We have to keep talking about it and making it known that accessibility is going to change along with 
the strides in technology and all of that. I totally agree, 100% with that. And, and Navi, what about you? How do you feel about the progress that we've made uh, so far? And, and and Aaron, I forgot to neglect to ask you, how long have you been gaming, Aaron? I've been gaming since the 80s. In the um, my first system was the Atari, so it's been a while. Yeah, you and I are around that same generation, Aaron. That's why you and I can get along. We gotta, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta keep these millennials in line that we have what is right. <laughs> All right, so 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 Navi, uh, why don't you let us know how long uh, you've been gaming? How do you feel about the strides we've made thus far? Yeah, um, I've been gaming since the '90s. I'm one of those millennials. <laughs> um, I think my first game system was an SNES, but I have an NES now still that I like to play. Um, I it's really exciting to see the strides that are happening in the video game industry in terms of accessibility, especially as someone who wants to be able to continue to play games as my multiple sclerosis continues to progress. I'm really hoping that those strides continue. And I'm just really passionate about making sure that the industry doesn't, that we don't kind of rest on our laurels and say like, oh, everyone's talking about accessibility, as Aaron says, and like, that's enough, but it's not enough to just kind of talk about it and and have it be a thing that we're all like, we care about it. I'm really passionate about um, helping folks in the industry make actionable change. Oh, I appreciate that. That was our first mic drop moment here. I, that's what I'm talking <laughs> about. Man. See, that, see, that's why when we get together and we have these conversations, you know, ones who are, are like-minded and who have the same kind of struggles, you know, we can speak real, we can speak truth to power. And that's what I'm talking about. So, so Mike, how do you feel about the strides that we've made? How long have you been gaming? I've been gaming as a unplugged player two in Mario um, back in the Nintendo days. But I remember playing like my first, first person shooter was Wolfenstein. Um, on the computer, and so we could kind of date myself on to that. I am uh, one of the millennial gamers, as we were talking about, and um, yeah, I with the strides of accessibility and gaming, I feel at least the last five years we have seen a lot of progress. Um, progress that which is a snowball, which we can turn into an avalanche, hopefully. I totally agree. I totally agree with that. And that's, that makes a lot of sense. And, and Aaron kind of touched on this about like some of the barriers. I mean, all, all you have, have touched on this and, and let's uh, spend some time on talking about some of those barriers right there, because I, I noticed what happens is, and I do this a lot when I'm consulting on different, uh, different games and I, and I make UX people crazy when I do this. Um, so they say, Paul, how is this? How does this work for you? And I'm like, it works great for me, but what about my buddy? Who's a, quiet and only can move his neck and they feel like i'm asking you but i'm like but but i i represent an army you know it, it's it's not about me i gotta make sure it's it's good for me but also good for the person who is who doesn't have that much mobility as me so i drive them crazy so when it comes to barriers out there aaron what are some of the barriers again that you've noticed uh, no matter what platform what console uh pc xbox uh playstation what are some barriers out there that you notice that you want to speak on during this time? Right. Um, for me, the biggest issue is the amount of controls needed to play certain games. Like, for example, the um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I think it was. Was it Odyssey? Maybe. Um, you can rebind the keys, but you have to use all the keys so to rebind it doesn't really matter because i still can't reach you know right trigger so it's just like the complexity of gaming and like simple is better and more accessible and i feel like that's not really talked about especially because they say oh you can rebind it yeah but i can't still reach half the buttons yeah i totally agree with that i have that frustration too and uh and uh mike and, and navi please uh chime in if you have any uh thoughts on what aaron's talking about too 
Let's go with Navi first. All yeah. right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Navi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of rebinding keys and things, yeah, it can be really difficult, especially uh, as someone who doesn't always have full use of my hands. Um, I use a foot pedal system sometimes for gaming. Uh, a, it's called a 3D rudder, and it has very limited amounts of keys I can put, and, and there are limited amount of switches I can mount to my desk to be able to play with. So that's definitely that's definitely something that I've come up against as well. I totally agree. Mike. Yes. Well, as a quadriplegic, and this is the limit of my hand function is, okay, I'm actually trying to move my hands, but this is the limit of my hand function. Hey, we but throw, hey, we throw a pause in the air. Throwing a pause up in the air. What we do? I'm totally okay with that. Um, the There's a lot of games, as we've seen, you know, we're th thinking about, like, how when Nintendo first came out, um, there's only a couple buttons that you would have to, to press in order to actually play the game. And as we have progressed through our technology in video games, we have added, I believe it's up to 18 buttons on at least just a traditional controller. Um, now, trying to press all these buttons at once in a game that's like a real-time game, say like a first-person shooter, um, can, can pose a, a huge obstacle, you know, a huge barrier. Um, Games that are turn-based, you know, RPG games and stuff like that, that allows a user to, you know, just take time to think um, what they want to do, and you know, it's, it, it it I we don't want to limit what games that we can play, and as games have become more complex, um, it's starting to widen this gap on games that are playable and accessible and yeah that's i feel like we you know we need to definitely talk about that and advocate for um different types of options from the ground up when somebody is uh developing a game i totally agree and mike you and i we have the same functionality too and i'm the same way you know when it comes to like uh like maneuvering things multiple buttons and like aaron was talking about you know why why does it have to be com be, that, be that complex to you know to to do certain uh disciplines in the game and aaron and i like we go back to like atari so we stick but <laughs> good you know and and the way that we see technology now is, is no reason why with machine learning with with ai with all this innovation this explosion of innovation that we have why we can't do that and again happy for the strides that we've had made you look at some of the some of the the games out there that that have put things in the software you know what, what naughty dog is doing what, what other developers are doing out there it's really really gratifying to see that and that brings up another another subject i had a discussion uh, one time with uh, a game developer and i was like hey who, who do you have working on your team and they said well, we have this person on our team i'm like well that person is a uh, paraplegic you know she doesn't have any hand problems you know like like like, like someone like myself have you know it's good to get us in that conversation too, building from the ground up. And like, even with, uh, with Navi, um, playing with her foot, you know, all these different voices out there getting in at the ground up or even like in the beginning of development, I think it's really helped us to, to achieve that, that kind of goal right there. What kind of feedback have any of you guys have gotten, um, when it comes to letting developers know when you're certain projects. And, and I know because of NDAs, there's only so much we can talk about, about the projects that we've been on, but, have they been receptive to some of the the input that that you see the need for? And let's start with Navi this time. Yeah, um, I mean, I found that working with indie developers is sometimes there's a lot less red tape to cut through every time you say like this is a change that needs to be implemented. Smaller development teams have a lot more power over the game and have the power to be a little bit more receptive to changes. They can just say, yeah, we're going to reimagine this game from the ground up. We'll start that right away. Whereas some of the bigger game development companies, there are processes and someone has to check with their boss and their boss and check if it lines up with the Gantt chart or not, whether or not we can like still push things out on time. So it, I have found that it's really a dream sometimes to work with indie developers um, for that reason. But um, one of the one of the things you touched on too was about how, you know, someone who's a paraplegic won't have the same barriers that I will have and someone who's blind or low vision won't have the same barriers. And I think that's why it is so important to have 
a variety of options for people for accessibility in games, not just like this is our one accessible mode, there's less buttons, so now it's accessible, or there's a colorblind mode, so now it's accessible. The, the most accessible games are the ones that have tons and tons of features that we can all pick and choose and say like, this works for me, this one doesn't work for me, uh, but I'm gonna turn on this one so that we can customize it really, really heavily and just have like a galaxy of options rather than like an accessible mode and a standard mode, you know? I totally agree. Go to the menu. If I want a la carte, I can order a la carte on the menu. You know what I mean? I love yes. that. And, uh, and, and Aaron, you want to chime in and give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, I found that um, like developers have been very receptive. What I've come across as far as that is gamers are less receptive, receptive to it. Um, they'll think it's like cheating to want accessibility and all this stuff, like get good, you know, it's like, no, but developers I found have been very receptive when you say, here's the issues with your game as far as accessibility. Yeah, I love that. And, and that kind of bothers me too, um, Aaron, when I hear gamers talking about cheating and things like that. And, you know, I'll go back to like curb cutouts, right? Before there were curb cutouts, uh, many of us who who use wheelchairs, you know, we would have to go out in the street, right? You know, just to try to try to navigate traffic across to go to the other side of the road. Uh, it helped us out, but everybody used curb cutout now. You ever notice how many people who don't have a disability go down that curb cutout just like us? So, you know, when he, when these gamers throw that kind of shade like that, you know, it's like, you don't have to use it. You know, nobody's forcing anybody to use those type of functions. If they want to use them, cool. But you know what, Aaron, on, on the DL, I bet you they're using them. They're they, they using Probably. them. They, yeah. they, they, they're just talking that noise, but they they, 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 they got to use it. I mean, uh, Mike, let's get your thought on, on everything. Yeah, the, the whole gatekeeping issue, I, I understand why it's present um, within gamers because we're competitive. As a gamer, we, we're always trying to see who has the highest points, who can do better, um, and with just whatever the game was made, I like how it was developed. Um, our argument is inclusive design, as in trying to bring everybody into um, a game so they can enjoy this type of experience. You know, not all games are competitive. A lot of the games that I'm starting to see, especially with indie developers, are all about experiencing the game, the story, the characters, the art, everything that's like involved with that. And we don't want to be limited to not being able to play those types of games because there's some type of development uh, issue with like the controls or something like that. And I feel that having these types of inclusive designs uh, from the ground up, it, it it allows this whole range of people that weren't probably even considered, um, not because they didn't care, like developers didn't care about it. It's this something that wasn't brought up to them. And, you know, I feel like it's something that all of us, you know, here on this panel and everybody else, you know, in the GA conference, um, it's up to us to 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 give that voice, you know, to to be those voices um, for for everybody. And you know, we're all diff. We all have our you know different types of disabilities: physical uh, disabilities, cognitive, intellectual disabilities. And um, having to put those into like having them considered, you know, is what we want. No, I, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. And. You know, do, do you guys sometimes see, I think that we as a community, the disabled gaming community out there, do you think sometimes we're our worst enemy? Um, sometimes with just this conversation that we have in. You know, what, what's your thought on that? Because I, you know, I sometimes I go on the Twitter and I look at all the chatter sometimes, you know, these, these tweet storms that, that it's like disabled on disabled crime and things like that. But, you know, what, 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 what's your view on that as far as, as a whole, how, how we're doing? Who, who wants to chime in first on that? And please. I'd, I'd like to talk about that. Um, the disability community is, is very diverse. There's people who are born with a disability, and there are those who become disabled through something like a, this motorcycle accident, like myself. Um, and I feel like 
having this ableist mindset before um, does like it, it, it taints the the advocacy of what we're trying to do in the disabled community and being able to just be empathetic and trying to understand different perspectives is something we, we really need to to learn and at least for me you know um it, that's something that i you know i i haven't thought about accessibility before i was injured i was uh, 10 years ago you know 2000 2011 and i never thought about accessibility you know i rode a motorcycle and i parked in those um the hash mark lines over you know i was that guy and you know being able to experience or you know quote unquote being in somebody's shoes um you, you're able to like gain this new perspective and it 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 lessens this whole i i guess it's just for me just trying to understand other people you know yeah uh and i get that i get that because we're, we're 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 not a monolith you know we're you know I'm black and disabled, you know, all of us are different nationalities, different genders, and, and we have different walks of life and different life experiences and things like that. And, and, and I think sometimes we can get into our, our proverbial fishbowl and our proverbial box. And it's all about us and our just experience. No, it's about all of us as a whole. You know, we are, you know, we're, we're a diverse community. I mean, we're the most loyal consumers out there. 30%. I mean, how many other, how many other, uh, you know, blocks of, of, of the population is loyal than us. So we, you know, we use our voice together. We can definitely make changes like we're making right now, you know, when it comes to gaming and things like that. And, and Aaron, let me get your thought on that too, if you don't mind, if you want to jump in on that. Yeah. So in the United, in the U.S., one in four people has a disability. And even within the same disability, there's so much diversity. diversity. Um, and I feel like the term disability community is difficult to really understand and you know think about because there's just so much um different opinions and different even ways of how to play games so i feel like you know we have to look also outside of disability to really reach um true inclusiveness and diversity and accessibility. So you, can get, you can become disabled at any time. Yeah. So it's not just about us, you know? Mm -hmm. I love that. And it, here, here's the thing that I noticed too, that when as many, as more of us get in positions now where we can be a part of teams now, you know, you look at uh, some of the teams like over at Microsoft, some of the teams over at Naughty Dog, you know, members who are who are part of us, you know, who are now making decisions and being able to bring us in now and say, hey, you know, these are some things that, that we need and we want. It's really gratifying that we've reached that point, but we need more of us in those positions as well. And, and Navi, let's get your, your thought, please. Yeah. The first thing I thought of when you brought up, are we sometimes our own worst enemy is how sometimes um, we can get a little bit almost tone policed by the rest of the internet of people being like, look at this, that's already happened. Be grateful that that exists. Be grateful for things like the Xbox adaptive controller. Don't be so angry. I've heard that before. Um, and I think one of the things that is important for us all to keep in mind is that uh, the reason that disabled gamers sometimes get up in arms when another game comes out and there's another discussion about like difficulty levels and just get good and all of this, the reason it makes us so angry sometimes is because it's a repeated issue that we're coming up against over and over and over and over. And every time we raise our voice about it, our voice might get a little bit louder. And that's kind of understandable if you think about it. And as a disabled woman, I'm not just fighting the fight for accessibility in video games, right? I'm fighting the fight for accessibility every time I go downstairs to get my mail and every time I try to vote in my local elections. And like, there are so many fights that we're always fighting. So sometimes the internet kind of, mirrors back at us and says like calm down you're a little too angry about this and i i like to remind people that like there's a reason that we say these things with volume sometimes and even like the intersectionality is so important to remember as well because my experience as a, a white 
disabled gamer is very different than the disabled experience of a, of a BIPOC person. Even just how angry I'm allowed to get is a very different amount of anger that I'm allowed to show online as a BIPOC person or a trans person. So it's important to like look at the whole picture and say like, yes, these people are advocating really loudly, but that doesn't mean we should listen any less. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That's a, that's a very good point. And let's talk about consoles and, and, and PC gaming and and some of those barriers that, that we see and how we can probably, or not probably, or how we can, you know, work on making progress towards that. And when it comes to, let's take console gaming first, what are some of those other barriers? I know we talked about the, uh, the, the controllers and things like that. And I know, Navi, you talked about uh, some of the features and games, you know, that, that are there that we would love to pick from. Are there any other barriers when it comes to console gaming um, that, that we all noticed? And if we notice those, let's see what we can, some of the feedback that we can give those who are a part of this conference right now. Because we do have a captive audience, you know. We got the people in the room who can make the changes. So let's go ahead and chat with that. Uh, and um, you want to go first on that, Mike? Sure. Well, with console gaming, there's the limitation of customization. That's probably the, the biggest thing that I've uh, experienced versus uh, PC. You know, PC gaming has a lot of other um, customizations. There's mods. There's a lot of things that you can do yourself or other people have done to enhance or just modify a certain game. With console gaming, when I first started, you know, it was really hard to find um, controller configuration on inputs and stuff on just trying to figure out if I wanted to switch an input to put it on a different position on a controller because I was trying to figure out how just even just how to utilize a traditional controller. And um, it wasn't until at least Borderlands 2 uh, when I found out that they can, you know, you could switch different buttons to place them in different spots. And I was able to adapt to that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's like really the, the biggest experience that I've, uh, that I've had and the thing, the barrier uh, that I've noticed with console gaming. I kind of, I agree with you on that because I remember when I first started gaming back again, um, after my injury, I started off with a mouse playing Madden. I think it was Madden 98 or something. And, and, that, and you were able to, um, don't throw on shade at me, Mike. I'm an old man. So don't, no, 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 no. Yeah, you know, and they had a mouse function where I can hike, I can pass, I can do everything with my mouse. And that really got me into wanting to game even more. And when we when we look at now with PC gaming, what you're able to do with with everything, I mean, it, it, you have a lot more functionality than you do on on console gaming. And and I definitely, I definitely get that, Mike. And um, um, Navi, you want to chime in on your take? Yeah. Um, one of the things when it comes to console gaming that's been a really big barrier for me, and I heard a big barrier for other people as well, is like we forget to talk about affordability and the uh, the experience of a person who needs different hardware. Um, so if I go out and buy, well, I have an Xbox already and I have an adaptive controller, but for example, if I, if I didn't and I wanted to go out and buy an Xbox, I then also can't just buy an Xbox and start gaming. I have to buy a controller that works for me, like the adaptive controller. And then I also have to buy a bunch of switches, buttons, foot pedals, things like that. And then I also have to buy hardware to mount those switches to my desk or my, my wheelchair or things like that. And then I personally don't have enough function in my hands to mount those things and use the power tools. So I have to hire someone to come and work in my house. So you can see the cost for disabled gamers ends up being much higher than it is for gamers who don't need any accessibility features. Um, that's a problem with PC as well but it's a little bit more customizable I found on the PC and a little bit easier to just like plug things in and find software to work. Whereas with consoles, I really think uh, the, the cost of things needs to be considered because affordability factors in. That's true. I, I know we, we've had discussions before um, in some like some sessions with other, other disabled uh, members of our community. And there was a term that was thrown around called the disabled tax. That's like a term yeah. where, where we where where it seems like we have to pay more for things that 
no one else has to pay more for it. So we really got to have to find a way that, you know, it's not like we're doing this for customization because we want some twenties on our ride, right? It's not, we're not trying to make it look good, right? What we're trying to do is so we can play it. You know, it's not like it's a necessity for us. So we really got to find what we can do to, to make that possible because many of our community, they're on, on government aid. They don't have a lot of money. So it, I, it hurts my heart that, that, that prevents some to be able to experience this wonderful thing that we all can do called gaming, you know? So, so yeah, that affordability is something that's, that's definitely on our mind. And, and Aaron, let's get your thought, please. Yeah. When, um, when the adaptive Xbox adaptive controller first came out, people were like, $99 is a lot. And it is a lot. But for me, before that controller, when I had to look up like buttons and such, one button cost me $300. And I was just like, this is not fair. And it's not right that accessibility has this cost. And it's definitely, as you said, a huge barrier, especially since like a lot of us live on seven hundred dollars a month you know so yeah yeah and so let's chime in on how uh, the the software um that's in game now and how has that helped us and what strides can we make in software now and uh, nav you want to start off with that one yeah um for consoles specifically or pc gaming too oh this will this will both we'll talk about them yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I think that I already touched on this briefly, but just having like lots and lots and lots of options is my favorite recommendation to make to game developers when they say like, how can we make our game more accessible? Often we're being asked that question and I think people expect, to, expect us to give them a checklist of like five things you can put into a game and make your program accessible. But realistically, just putting in as many customizable options as you can, options for bigger subtitles, smaller subtitles, volume, like things that you wouldn't even necessarily think have to do with accessibility really do at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, just really high levels of customization. I would love to see more of that in, in the software. Yeah, definitely. Mike. So um, that's, that's kind of, as that's definitely funny with um Apex Legends has, you know, the accessibility options, like as it's specifically on this game, it's a first person shooter for those who don't know. And I know that there are a lot of gamers who don't have a, um, a color blindness and they use one, a certain colorblind um, feature on there in order for them to see better while um, another character is using one of their powers. Uh, because of the contrast of the colors, it makes it a lot easier to target your 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 enemy, um, and it's it's pretty interesting with like the software that's in there. With PC gaming, uh, I'm using a program called REWASD, and it essentially is a basically um, uh, input configuration program. So I'm able to use the Xbox adaptive controller and a uh, Xbox elite controller, um, kind of making a pseudo co-pilot, which is a, a feature Xbox uh, coined for them to use two controllers to work simultaneously as one. Um, that program, REWASD, has actually opened my PC gaming uh, world up completely. And I've been able to play a lot of games that are in early access, you know, the really hype games, the scary games that are that are out that they they brought out. But, you know, th those developers haven't really considered, you know, input, you know, configurations or even just colorblind or any type of accessibility features on there yet. But with having certain programs that are out there, um, it, 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 it opens up a, a big window. For, for those, at least for like physical disabilities. Yeah, I, I totally agree. In that. And I'm, I'm going to chime in on what you said too, because I, I had the same experience like, like your friend had. I'm going to chime on that. I want to get Aaron first. Aaron, uh, well, let's, let's get your thought, please. Yeah. 
So um, what Navi said about customization and having options is definitely true. And one thing that people don't talk about a lot is, um, for example, I play on PC mostly. And the option to make a game played in window mode lets me use like the on-screen keyboard in Windows and lets me use different other software to play the game with my mouse. So being able to change the window size of the game is definitely an accessibility feature that I don't think a lot of people consider. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and Mike, to go back to you talking about your friend, uh, same thing happened to me. I was working on a project and I was having a hard time getting past this uh, this one level. And I was like, you know, let me let me play around with these colorblind, you know, features. So I, I used one of the colorblind features and I was able to pass that level. Either one or two things, Mike, either I'm colorblind or that, <laughs> that, or that helped me out too. So, you know, I definitely get that. And that's one thing I, I find myself doing too. I'll, I'll I'll dip around into the uh into the to the vision into the hearing impaired features just to just to check them out take them out for a while because you know it's it, it makes game gaming more more inclusive and more fun for me you know so yeah I de I definitely get that and when when it comes to like this whole topic that we're talking about today what is one thing you really want to get across? Uh, to those who are listening and, and watching our panel right now. What is that one thing? Mike, you want to go first? I think the biggest thing is don't – we were talking about with, like, Navi, it's like how, how loud we can be. Don't be apologetic on how loud you are about advocating for an inclusive game uh, for accessibility features um in in order for us to to be heard sometimes we have to really be loud and um the the gatekeeping you know we want we want to play video games sometimes just to play video games we don't want to be the best pro gamer for a certain video game sometimes we just want to just play this game and um really this i guess would this would be a a call out uh to the developers that are watching this that you know prioritize accessibility and inclusive design in your game from the foundation because if you have that strong cornerstone your game is going to have a lot of longevity you're going to include so many people that you haven't even thought that um would want to play your game so, and that's that's really all i have to say on that no i, I appreciate that man and, and, and navi we got you back so be as loud as you want <laughs> Well, we got you. You know, if anybody throws some shade at you, just at me and at at Mike and at Aaron. We got you. All right. So don't don't even sweat that. And and uh Navi, what's something that, that you want to let it once know who are listening right now, just about you know, motor accessibility and and this topic in general. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I come up against, even just in my daily life the most often, is that people don't have a very good understanding of the fact that disability isn't static. It's not like um, you're either, you know, for example, it's not that you're either in a wheelchair or you're out of a wheelchair. I've often had people be like, what? You just stood up from your wheelchair? And it's like they don't understand that some people have some days that they can walk a little bit some days that they can't walk at all. And it's the same thing with my motor function. Um, and that's why the, the heavy customization is so important. And knowing that there's not just one accessible mode you can create that's gonna work for everyone all the time. Because honestly, with the way that my MS fluctuates from day to day, if I'm tired, if I'm hungry, or if I'm in a relapse, um, my hands might not be able to function at all, but other days they might function incredibly like fast. So um, it's it's not possible to have one accessible option that works for everyone because it's not even possible to have one accessible option that works for one person all of the time. And a lot of people don't realize that our disabilities can fluctuate and that that level of customization is so heavily important for all of us. Yeah, another mic drop moment. See, Navi. <laughs> 
I mean, you you are spitting some really good knowledge for us here. <laughs> I really appreciate all you guys are. I mean, you and Aaron and uh, and also yeah. Michael, you guys are really giving some good insight out there. Even like someone like myself, you know, who who's a part of our community, you know, who does our line of work together. You know, I'm learning a lot from from all you three, and and this is awesome that we're able to have this conversation. And 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 Aaron, let's get your thought, please. Yeah, um, I think that accessibility benefits everyone. Um, as we've all mentioned, anyone can use accessibility features. And I feel like developers should really consider that even as they're just thinking about the game they want to make. Because so often I'm pulled in as a consultant after the game is done and I'm kind of like, why am I here? Yeah. But like, you know, I think it has to be done right from the start. And yeah. that way it's easier to implement. I totally agree. I totally agree. And hopefully the next go around, they'll get us there in the beginning and not and not when it's uh not when it's over. And can I, I want... can I just jump in on that really Absolutely. quickly? I mean, yeah. uh, another thing I think developers don't realize is not only is it easier to implement, it's way cheaper. It is so much cheaper to in the long run. Often I've been told we can't afford to undo all the work we've done. It's not in the budget now to implement this. And even the small implementations that we ask for, people end up having to redo a bunch of work and it costs money. So developers, if you bring us in sooner, if you start from that foundational place of having an accessible game from square one, it's going to be cheaper. So. Yeah, see, <laughs> see, see you're you messing up my hustle, Navi, because <laughs> when I get on a project in the beginning, I'm like orange m ms Perrier water, I need my <laughs> So, so you messing it up for me, Navi. Stop. You know, just, you know, and and I know there's some developers out there who are listening and watching right now are wondering, hey, are you guys going to talk about mobile gaming and VR? Yes, we are. So I wanted to get that first, talking about console and PC gaming. And now we're going to delve in for a little while of mobile, VR, and our take on that. So let's talk about VR now. What are some of the challenges that we personally face trying to use VR, especially with our with our motor issues. Who want to go first on that? Mike, you want to go? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Um. So okay, definitely, tr you know, the the joysticks. I think the only VR game that I would be able to that I would just more consider on playing because it's it's I'm not using the buttons is Beat Saber. You know, all I have to do is just once I get the the controls into my hands and fixate them and strap them on there because of my grip is not as um, strong you know when I'm trying to swing things uh, yet VR is it's it's a very interesting thing I I've was I've I've talked to people about um, what they can do to include people who have like motor issues on using manipulating their controllers. And one of the suggestions was just hand gestures and mm -hmm. being able to customize those hand gestures. Because say for me, you know, I have my, this is my arm function, right? I can move my arms basically like that. Not everybody has that. So we, we're trying to uh, configure arm gestures or movement gestures to whatever function it is for that video game is something that vr developers uh need to consider i, I totally agree and, and one, one of the issues i have in vr and maybe you guys can chime on this too is that when you have to set it up right they say here you know draw this line or this circle right there so i i can't do it because mike you and i you know we got we got the same struggle so i'm having my wife do it i'm like no dear you have to do this with this way this way no 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 you got to be over here you got to be over here and it's just really tough trying to set up that barrier of of your of your play space and and Aaron, have you had any any um, frustrations with VR yourself? Yeah, so I can't I can't use VR as it is right now because it's not just about like using my hands, but I can't turn my head or move my neck at all. So like any type of VR experience 
has to be something where you don't have to turn your head mm -hmm. and that's like not much you know so at that point i just i just don't use it because i can't and i feel that it's um being talked about more which is great so you know, we, we're we going to give the developers a freebie right here, okay, guys? This is the only freebie we're going to give developers right now, okay? There's technology out there with artificial intelligence and eye gaze that can definitely help out. That's the only freebie you guys are going to get right now. <laughs> Navi, what is your take? Yeah, oh, VR gaming is so frustrating. I want to do it. I want to do it so bad. I have a, a Quest headset, and there are some games that I love, but I can only do VR on days when my when i have like pretty much full motor function of my hands and legs which is almost never so it's really really frustrating and one of the things i think people don't really realize i was at eglx once and went to demo a vr game before i ever even bought a headset and the developer came out when i started having this one problem and he was like i had never even thought of this problem but vr games a lot of them don't even let me play from like square one, I can't even play the game at all because I'm considered too short. I'm four foot 10 when I'm standing, but in my wheelchair, I'm like three feet tall. So it'll tell me stand up, stand up. And I'm like, I can't stand up, I'm in a wheelchair. Um, and so it'll say that I'm too short to interact with the game. And that doesn't make any sense. There are also a lot of games where you have to be able to move around your space and do things with your hands. If I need to use my hands to push my manual wheelchair and then turn to shoot something in super hot, I can't, sh I'm like shooting my guns at the ground while I'm turning and then I'm shooting. So uh, there's gotta be better ways. And like you said, the eye tracker technology is out there, gesture technology. Like, I think this is just something that people haven't thought through yet in VR gaming. And it would be really cool to start that conversation being like a constant thing in the VR. Cause right now it kind of feels like VR is just something disabled people don't get to do. Yeah. And that sucks. And you know what, Navi, Navi, that's the only freebie they're going to get. No, no more freebies for them. Okay. <laughs> but, but you know, um, you know, uh, I'll tell you a funny story and, and hopefully that developer is not, not on watching this right now because it was uh, E3 had to be like six, seven years ago. And this guy was like, here, here, try, try, uh, try, try our VR. I was like, you know, I'm, it won't pick my wheelchair up. It won't do that. It won't do that. So he goes ahead and hooks me up. Right. So he started driving my wheelchair for me. Right. So drove my wheelchair. <laughs> he ran himself over. <laughs> I messed, uh, he messed up his own display. Oh no! And I was like, dude i told you man it, it's, it's not gonna work so and the thing about it i love vr and i'll because at e3 that same e3 this guy said he put he put the oculus on me and now i haven't at, at that time i hadn't stood up in over 20 something years right so he had me like on the moon and he's jumping me around in the moon and i felt butterflies in my stomach for the first time in almost 20 years that's experience right there we're really not able to to really experience to the full because of the barriers that we have. I mean, VR is so incredible. And if we can get to the point where we can get that just under, you know, straightened out and and the way that we can use it, I mean, guys, that that just opens up a whole new world. Imagine like like you getting a fastball from Clayton Kershaw and playing playing baseball. You know what I mean? It's like see that it's I'm excited as you can tell about it, but let's move on because we're we're almost running out of time, and that is mobile mobile gaming now. So, what are some some of the barriers that we have on mobile gaming, and what are some things that can make it easier for us? And we'll start off with you, uh, Mike. So, uh, mobile gaming that was actually what I started out as after I got out of my rehabilitation because I didn't think I could play you know controller games, console games like that. So I played, you know, Clash of Clans. Very easy, you know, I can touch it. I usually use like the knuckle of my pinky in order to manipulate and select certain things. Well, there's other games that are starting to be developed out there. Um, PUBG Mobile, uh, that came out and it's a first person, third person shooter. And what I had to do, at least for myself, was I used two styluses and I fixated them on my hands. And so I was able to manipulate the controls and um, I was able to you know play fairly well but 
And what's really nice about PUBG Mobile, at least from when I found, is that you can resize um, certain buttons, like the the if you want to like make your joystick a little bit larger, if you want to make the shoot button, you know, in a different position, like you can literally map it out on that screen. Um, and I played this on the phone. It'd probably be a, incredibly easier on a tablet because you got more room. Mm -hmm. But um, when you know, I feel like when developers are making these games, they're making it to where you're holding it like this yeah. and then using your thumbs and stuff. Now I can hold this, but manipulating and being able to press the buttons, it it's something that, you know, my competitive self says, ah, I'm not going to be able to play this game. Even though I can play the game, I just want to be able to play it to the capability that I know that I can play a certain game. Yeah. That took me back, Mike. I see. Mike, Mike know, you know what a wrist ribbon is, right, Mike? Yes. I, I used to have two wrist ribbons, and that's how I type on the on the keyboard trying to, yeah. play, trying to play battle chess back in the day. So with, with the stylus, that, that, that took me back there and everything. But, yeah, very good point, very good point. And, uh, Navi? Yeah. Um, one of the mobile games I play a lot is Pokemon Go, and it requires <gasps> you to get out of the house and do stuff. And when now the you, pandemic... Now, now, you didn't get hurt, right? You, you didn't get hurt, right, playing Pokemon no, Go? No, right? not, okay. <laughs> not yet. Not okay. yet, right, but there's been some close calls, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, when the pandemic kind of hit, they uh, increased the radius of stuff and made it so that you could do stuff from home and made it so you could send gifts from further away from people and do do trades from a little further away from people because they didn't want everyone like grouping up in parks and grouping up at places. And that really opened up the, the world to me because I can't just like walk around all day like other people can. I get tired out in my like manual wheelchair. Um, and now that the pandemic is like winding down, they're talking about and other games that have this same AR feature, the augmented reality of like walk around and go get these steps and things. Um, there's that, like I can't get steps as it were you know and I can't uh so so hiding things behind this like wall of being a certain level of physically able in games I was really excited to see that go away in a lot of games to accommodate the pandemic and I'm sad to see it coming back they're saying like oh we're going to make it so that you have to go back out to poke stops to get things and and other games are doing it as well I don't mean to single out just Niantic but there these games are have shown us during the pandemic that you can make it accessible for people to play more remotely and not change the experience of the people who want to go out to a park and meet up their friends at a poke stop. So it would be really cool if developers remembered that like, especially of these augmented reality games that like not everyone interacts it with the world in the same way. And that doesn't have to affect anyone else's gameplay. If you let us play too. That's true. Get us in on the beginning. Let's, you know, I We'll we'll forgo our orange M and M's and Perrier water. Just get us in there, you know. We'll, we'll we want to help. And, then, and Aaron, let's, Aaron, let's get your thoughts. Yeah, uh, I can't really play mobile games just because I can't hold the phone out far enough to see it and to reach it. So I'm old. So to me, I'll just play games on my computer, and mobile gaming isn't. For me, not even just because it's not accessible, but because I don't know, it just gives me a headache mm -hmm. to look at that tiny screen to play gaming. But it should be accessible. I That's totally true. agree. Yeah. I totally agree. And developers out there, if you're from the mobile platform, your mission in life from now on is to make mobile gaming appealing to Aaron. If you do that, <laughs> You guys have, have done something amazing because I'm kind of the same way, Aaron, when it comes to mobile gaming. You know, it's, you know, I'll play like some games like like Mike was talking about where I can just use my thumb to press down and things like that. But if it becomes too cumbersome, if it becomes too frustrating, then I'll just go to the console or to the PC, you know, and it'd be nice if uh, if I had that option as well, too. Well, in closing, my dear friends, five years from now, what would you guys personally like to see when it comes to accessibility, inclusion, and making gaming truly, truly inclusive for all? And Navi, why don't we let you go? Oh, I would love to see it become the standard in the industry that development studios have not just one person, but a team of people who work on 
diversity, equity, and inclusion within the company, and that a big portion of that be um, accessibility within their games. Because I think it's important to have um, a cross-disability uh, lens when we look at accessibility and make sure that we're reaching as many types, uh, people with lived experience of as many types of disability as we can. So just asking one person to do this job is, is not enough. Um, but yeah, seeing it be more the standard, even in the past five, 10 years, I've seen way more people being hired like I am to work full time with one development studio. Uh, it used to just be consulting work that we could get, and now there's starting to be little. So I would love to see that expanded to bigger teams that have a very intersectional and cross-disability focus of inclusion. Yeah, isn't isn't that a great time that we have now where we can we can be hired and things like that? I, I told a friend of mine, I said I, I might retire from from the media and broadcasting and go go straight into uh, to gaming and, and accessibility, be a, be accessibility brand ambassador. I mean, it's it's a really Really cool time that we definitely live in. And uh, Mike, your your closing thoughts too about five years from now. What would you like to see? Oh, well, I definitely agree with Navi on having accessibility teams that are made up from people who have a wide wide range of disabilities, or at least be able to um, access people um, like us to, you know for the alpha process or the beta process and developing their video games. Like I want to commend also like Xbox with their Xbox adaptive controller. Um, I know that they're not making money off of that controller. And I would like to challenge more tech companies to focus on morality over money. That even though a product isn't going to make you money, it's going to, bring more people into their ecosystem um, and be don't be afraid to have to try something out out and possibly fail not make money off of it um, in the past there has been consoles the jaguar console the dreamcast console um, sega you know they, they oh as that is dreamcast but you know don't be afraid to make these um to, to, to take these chances um, and try to develop these types of technologies that would include, um, you know, uh, basically 10% of your top population of the world population. Yeah. Now that's uh, that's real talk right there, Mike, you know, you know, to do, do something for the, for the greater good. And, you know, and, and hearing you and Navi, you know, talk about how, uh, you know, putting more of us in, in these roles and being part of the team, you know, kind of reminds me of like back in the days when they would say, oh, we, we have a black that works with us or we have a woman that works with us. You know, no, no, you need you need more than just a black and just a woman. You know, mm -hmm. you need you need more of, of the community there to really to really get get this get this inclusive inclusiveness and, and some and some really good feedback too on these, on these projects. And um, Aaron, let's get your get your closing thoughts. Five years from now, what would you like to see? I would like to see developers and gamers understand that accessibility isn't getting from point A to point B. Accessibility is an ongoing process that should never end because accessibility isn't one thing. And as technology continues to advance, the need for accessibility will always be there. Well said, well said. And I don't think my closing thoughts can be as 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 good as you guys, but I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try right here. And I would like to say to ones who are listening and, and watching right now, imagine a world where you were not able to game. What would your life be like? What if when you played your game, you had a frustrating experience? What if you weren't able to really experience an amazing product that some of these teams are putting together. How, how would that make you feel? I think if you think in terms of that, I think you would really understand where we're coming from, that all we want to do is be able to play and our friends to play too, who are part of our community. We really want to strive together to make this gaming experience inclusive for all. And we can definitely reach that goal because we have some great minds. And with you in our corner, we can definitely achieve this. 
my friends, it's been great chatting with you. Thank you guys so much. And you guys are so awesome to the community, so awesome to the gaming community, the accessibility world. You guys keep on shining and keep on thriving. And you guys take care. Thanks. Thank See you later. There was so much amazing content in that panel. Obviously, everyone in the Discord chat is blowing it up about how phenomenal the talk was. And it really, there was so much that was covered. But just to highlight a few of, of the topics that I, I loved, and I think we, we need more of, is, you know, reminding people that, you know, you need to research, you need to do more to see if your solution actually solves the problem you're trying to address. You know, the number of people who were telling Erin, oh, but we have remappable controls when it doesn't matter when she can't reach the trigger button anyway. Um, of course, uh, there was also, you know, so much uh, specific feedback that was coming out uh, against titles and James Berg said in chat, every time our games get, ca get called out in ways that are specific and shareable, Folks working in accessibility get another piece of ammo. It's another chance for us to educate our teams and motivate them through empathy. So again, definitely share any of those specific pieces of feedback you have for games, because I know uh, I feel <laughs> yeah, you know, that I want to share that with my teams and I'm already getting tagged in Discord, uh, James saying I, I'm getting him in trouble. Look, I mean, honestly, I think we had one of our first like jokes of the day that how uh, all of our best work is under NDA. Um, so that was, of course, making making me laugh. You know, the other thing that made me laugh was uh, Aaron's comment in chat. Uh, the funniest thing is when, as I'm playing in bronze level in Overwatch, my teammate yells at me to get good. Like, sir, it's bronze, which you are also in. <laughs> but honestly, there were some other serious things in there. This talk about how uh, disability is not a monolith. And person to person will have a different experience. And even how uh, Navi highlighted as a, a white woman, she can talk about that experience differently than someone else may be able to, which actually, you know, led to just get, it's okay to be, be angry, you know, don't uh, push your voice down. Um, I mean, so many other topics, how it's easier to do accessibility from the beginning, the financial impact of, you know, the disabled tax and everything that you need. Um, and, and really, as uh, Tony said in chat, this is one of the best panels I've ever listened to, just all around interesting and informative. I love hearing about people's personal experiences. And that is a lot to digest. And, you know, with that, we feel like it's a great time to transition to lunch. We are going to be having an hour long break so that you are able to get food. I'm able to get food and we can all take a break. Now, some other things to highlight uh, that you can see during the lunch break is number one, we have a new Discord channel to show your threads. So many of us are wearing special clothes, special t-shirts, and we don't have a way to show them off like we would an in-person event. So please head over to the Show Us Your Threads channel and share with us what you're wearing today, even if you're in your comfiest pajamas because you're watching from home. And you know what, if you need some new threads or magnets or pins or some other fun things, we actually launched a red bubble shop for this game accessibility conference. We um, are putting forward both standard things like our logo and taking content from the event and making it into shirts like we've actually already made a uh, be angry stay angry shirt like while this panel was running and put it out so be sure to check that out and of course we've had several people asking for our speakers twitter handles you can actually find all of our speakers twitter links on their speaker bio in the conference itself so with that i hope that you have plenty of things you can keep to keep you entertained while you're eating your lunch and that you get to have a lovely break. With that, I'm gonna go get some food and I will see you when we come back at 1.15. Thank you so much.
Hello, everyone. I hope you had a good break and you're feeling refreshed and ready for the second half of day one. I can't believe we're in the second half of the day already. Uh, for me personally, it feels like it's going by so fast. So this next talk is from Cherry Thompson. We're going to be joining Cherry in a meta thinking about our approaches as an industry. We'll look backwards, sideways, and inwards because ultimately design is about so much more than accessibility options. Cherry is trying to slow down and take stock of their years with game accessibility. What came before and one undoubtedly lies ahead. This is difficult work. The nature of games almost goes against the goal of accessible. Without barriers, would it even be a game? To find the answer, we need to figure out what the heck challenge is, or even what accessibility is. We've done a lot, so it's time to check the map and make sure we're heading in the right direction. After all, <laughs> we have no waypoints. It's okay to stop running for a second and catch our breath together. I'm still getting used to these digital presentations and I miss everyone, but um, I'm Cherry and today I'm attempting to peer into the distance. I work on accessibility at Ubisoft and I used to be a freelance specialist. Projects I contributed to before UB include Horizon Zero Dawn and Forbidden West, Destiny 2, Avengers and Dreams. At Ubisoft it's been Watch Dogs Legion, AC Valhalla, Far Cry 6 and more in development. My job is still a bit of a mystery from what I hear. I'm sort of a hyper-specialized designer with accessibility expertise in everything from 3Cs to systems, level, world, interaction, audio. Since it's broad, of course, my expertise is secondary to senior designers in those fields. We shape gameplay and player interaction together with the concept of accessibility, guiding design intentions, facilitating tech, brainstorming constraints, and yeah, the tough decisions about prioritization because we always have them. There's a bit more to it. It's not easy to gab about without specifics, but most importantly, I'm working on finding ways to pass knowledge on so that all designers can become experts in what they need to know. Most of us have been doing this work for more than a minute. I think we started to see a shift in pace around five years ago, but maybe even a bit before, 2014 maybe? It's kind of hard to put a pin in it. It was a slow burn, but suddenly we got the snowball over the summit and we've been chasing after it ever since. It's time to take a moment, stop running and reflect. I know it's hard, but it's okay, I promise. In 2018, Ian invited me for the final talk at the second inaugural EH, GA Conf. A totally low stakes, low pressure talk, right? Well, I had just three weeks. I wasn't sure what I wanted to talk about. I just started writing and it turned out super personal. Before I knew it, I'd written a love letter. It was complicated, like any love. Games saved my life and they were hurting me. Centered around my first stroke when I realized it wasn't me, it was the games. The seed for game design though was planted way back as a wee five-year-old Beb, falling in love with programming a Jessup's turtle on a BBC Micro. Then I stuck my hand in games accessibility in 2010. A programmer friend at United Front Games gifted me Mod Nation Racers. I was now a hardcore fan of this little play create cart racer. There were some really neat bugs that players exploited, which was fascinating. But more legitimately, maybe the community created amazingly complex things with totally rudimentary design tools. So I was obsessed with how players were interacting with the systems they were given. Thanks to winning a spot on the PlayStation blog, I met lifelong friends in the lobby, but I'd wake up with my hands frozen in a claw. Probably because we raced and left until 3am most nights, but I had to mod my controller for the first time and fight off friendly jabs about how trigger extensions were cheating. 
It was personal and emotional, but I also wanted it to be design forward. So people had concrete steps to take away with them that day. We were still trying to get through the door. There were a few exceptions, and Household Games announced their work with Clinton Lexa that week. The ball was already rolling. It just felt like we couldn't rock the boat. There was still a lot of talk about why it was important or if, if it was even possible, so I tried to be extra gentle. Like, please let us in. We promise we won't change things. We promise we won't disrupt. I said I was proud then, and it's even more true now. We're here. Everyone's listening. People are asking the big stuff. How do we do this and how we do we do it better? Something I called cherry mode back then seemed to really resonate. I think someone yelled it out and tweeted it. Brandon, maybe? Was that you? I still believe in the idea that disabled players can be um, empowered by customizing their experience. And I wasn't the only one talking about options because it was how we were opening doors. Then chats with mentors helped me see that this could be prescriptive. I needed to change it up. The results weren't what I anticipated. And for me personally, I wish I hadn't taken an approach that felt like a softer and more acceptable idea of what accessibility is. Everything contributes to the road we've traveled, so no regrets. Besides, we can make all the noise we like now we've arrived, right? A lot of my strengths as a designer are thanks to the opportunity to learn from so many of the industry's best over the last several years. Collaboration isn't a prescription, it's an exchange of expertise to develop robust ideas and intentions. So my approach is accessibility by intentional design. It's holistic, while actively destigmatizing and working towards accessibility from the beginning. Not because it's more affordable or easier, it is both of those things, but importantly, because it means opportunity. So hi, I'm in a bit of a different part of the map. Let's chat. <laughs> Common thinking on games accessibility is usually one idea with slightly different words. Accessibility options, settings, or features. We can get a lot of insight here. What we've been doing, how we've approached it, and how that informs how we talk about it. A complete circle. We're racing full throttle now and have achieved so much already. That's why this is the exact moment to slow us down, reassess, and consider the future impact of what we're doing today. I ended up over there on the map because games accessibility as a whole is a totally fun design problem to solve to me. Everything is a system. I'm always reworking my approaches and growing my knowledge from elsewhere. I also had so many philosophical conversations and I'm really thankful for those. You all know who you are. But remember, no matter how it feels, we're never alone on the map. We have some questions to answer. Are we going in the right direction? How would we even know without waypoints? And where do we look for clues? There's a great concept to pull from. We all know about calling people out. Well, I try to practice calling people in. It distributes the responsibility and removes judgment. We look at the reasons why things happen and we talk through it with kindness. And we hear empathy is important for design. Well, it's time to level up. Empathy is passive and it's heavily influenced by our perspective. Compassion demands active engagement in someone else's perspective and follow through. Exploring compassionate design got me thinking about the relationship to knowledge. And I came to, if we work with compassion, but without knowledge, we can end up with misguided results. But if we have knowledge and no compassion, we might end up lost, overconfident in our solution and wrong about impact. This could be seen as paternalism, action without consent. A misguided approach is usually good intentions. We don't usually have a ton of time to get philosophical and meander, but we need to make time because later is too late. We also need compassion for each other. Compassion plus knowledge brings comprehension. Obstacles to effective compassion and bi are bias and privilege. I love this talk by Tatiana Mack called Systems of Systems. Give it a Google or follow the link. She illustrates concisely how history and culture shape everything we design. We're born into most privileges. We might not seek bias out, but it is our responsibility to identify and undo them. We need accurate and destigmatized perceptions for design. We might think that we're acting with compassion when we're not. 
Intent does not erase impact. Tatiana highlights the words intent and impact. Passive rarely guarantees impact. We got, really got to do the work to defog our perspectives since they're colored for us. Here, yeah, looks like I'm the quest giver. Beyond the social model of disability, we fight the instinct to protect and provide. It might feel noble, like a good deed. That's a clue it'll end up patronizing. If our good feeling is central to the actions, it's intent over impact. Disabled people tolerate the outcome of this a lot in the day to day. We destroy pity, unrecognized but buried, so dig deep. For me, the feeling is a quiet, sad butterfly in the pit of my stomach. It's all around us, endless disability stuff framed by pity. Notice how every single video has a melancholy but triumphant piano track? Subtleties clouding how we think about each other. And pity distorts, distract, uh, pity distorts compassion because we're looking down. Vanquish our guilt, that sounds so dramatic. But it is painful knowing we didn't do enough. But don't project it on what we do next. Guilt ruins the trust we have in ourselves. Do what we do best. Design, research, communicate, facilitate. We're more likely to take prescriptive solutions without checking just to get something done. With all this in mind, we'll claim a broader vision by working with ourselves and being open to others as part of our creative processes. Re revisit frequently. Without defining for ourselves, we follow. We'll guess everyone else must be right if something's popular enough. Bias is cognitive too. Teaching games accessibility intensively for years and a thought just hit me last week. We don't need to redefine accessibility. We actually need to define it for ourselves. I'm disabled and come from other accessibility. I've been harping on about how accessibility is different in games, but I didn't twig. So maybe the current thinking is undefined. It's relatively straightforward to see how. Going from, oh, I didn't mean for that to be a barrier in the design, to let's create an option to avoid it. Seems logical to understand that as accessibility. Oh, but this is a narrative fallacy. It's a cognitive conclusion from backwards reasoning without having all the info. It's normal to simplify so we can process reality. And on top of that, in games, we have a culture of simplify to produce. It's a solid practice to reverse engineer our work and look back on postmortems. We also need to be aware of the potential for hindsight bias, especially in an emerging field. It feels logical when there is truth to it. An option might facilitate accessibility. Other times, it's a bandage over the problem. But it's not accessibility itself. Some aspects of accessibility will always need to be addressed by options. Player customization can be empowering, but that's not always true. It's more complicated than we thought, but it's okay. Turning to other features, I can picture a feature standing on a hill with a big boomy voice. I'm the king of the world. I am accessibility. But like, that's just a lot to put on a feature. They can contribute, but they can't fully represent accessibility, even for one person. We might talk about it also as a tangible object. Say, this game has accessibility, but this game doesn't. Accessibility is always there, just in varying degrees. The effort or intent of the creators doesn't even matter, because it didn't spring into existence when developers became aware of it. Every game has always been more or less accessible. I think we give it a solid shape so it can be pointed at and talked about, but this is really the efforts made for accessibility. Again, part of the picture, no doubt. But all of this says a lot about intent and nothing about impact. This tweet from Bryce tickled me because we should embrace cognitive dissonance. It's where we find reality. He says, voiceover is a feature of iOS. Closed captions are feature a feature of movies. Accessibility is not blank, except when it is. We are not in the business of absolutes. For context, Billy Gregory, Gregory regularly says that accessibility isn't a feature and a lack of accessibility is a bug. I yelled yes to both of them out loud, but then a few days later, I was thinking features are still the center of this picture. Yes, 
voiceover as a feature, it provides and improves accessibility. It was even created for accessibility. It still isn't accessibility, it's a feature. And I felt like we were getting closer there. But Converse Logic, so, so Converse Logic tells us that all games features impact accessibility because if a player can interact with it, it needs accessibility consideration. And official community research hasn't disproved this yet. But features exist in a web, inside systems, inside our various realities. All right, this is where I ended up. Accessibility is a player's access to the gaming experience that's either improved or impeded by the design decisions that we make. It's relative to an individual player. Some features might be more critical to increasing accessibility for some players. No single thing or group of things can embody a global impact. Some more context is needed for the difference between an accommodation and accessibility. We can tell by looking at impact which one it is. An accommodation is a concession or assistance we provide when there isn't equitable access. It's usually when existing systems are least malleable. Accessibility is access, and the unsaid is that it's equitable and inclusive. So imagine a level main entrance to a building. A ramp would be accessibility too, unless entrances at the side or the back, which are accommodations. Worse, a bell for a worker to bring you a ramp. Now you're a task in someone's day. An assist would be if you needed someone to push you up a ramp that's too steep. Worst, someone carries you in. Yep, that happens. Accessibility is participation on par with everyone else. No inconvenience, embarrassment, or pity. And it doesn't make someone a spectacle. There are times when an accommodation is all we can do. Is something better than nothing? Not always. The world has a lot of harmful accommodation in the disguise of accessibility. It's not our responsibility as games developers, but context to define our goals. The first time we use an accommodation, it feels amazing. A popular fancy restaurant just grateful you can get into. After time, less so. When this happened to me, I wondered if typical customers would be okay with the smelly garbage entrance, dirty hands, inconvenience kitchen staff, and sitting at the only table without a light. The accessible seats in theaters are up front, far to the side. Your friends can't sit with you, but not that they'd want to. The second screen for captions goes in your lap. Good luck watching the movie. At least you can go, right? We have special seating areas not because they're better for us. It was business and never went further. That's segregation. Eventually, people disengage. The consequences can be unintentional thanks to a lack of insight. As we head for maturity in our field, now is the time to reflect and grow our compassion. We need to concretely define our experiences because what's equitable is, a, is complex for games. So we can provide experiences to disabled players on par with everyone else. Options opened a door and it felt amazing right now. What about down the road? Are we being equitable and are players being siloed? When we do have to make accommodations, if we ask these questions, we can ensure it's the best we can do to break ground and destigmatize and avoid segregation at all costs. In the end, sometimes the best we can do is just that. Even if the perfectionist fights back, Perfectionism lends itself to the work. It's also a risk to us and our teams. We care so much about players, colleagues, and the work. We want to do things right. We can only keep moving if we accept concessions. Sometimes it's not so big, just a lower level of completion. Like, don't have a full UX experience for a menu narration yet, as we don't. We inch along. It's a recipe for burnout, believe me. Um, but Tara gave a great talk at GAConf last year and I'm going to be watching it this week myself. Just take care of yourself, okay? Because it's not all or nothing. Sometimes it's three steps forward, one step back, and half a step sideways. That's a net win though, right? I know we're aching to be told how to solve accessibility, but we're jumping a little bit ahead there. Accessibility isn't something that gets done. Bam, we achieved it. It has to become part of every single thing we do, and it never goes away. 
Think of it like a magic eye trick. Slow down, relax our muscles, then flex them in a new way and shifting focus to the spaces around our, so our approaches so far, you never know what shape we'll build. The comprehension we need to succeed is just going to take time to learn. It's painful to acknowledge this because we impact human beings. We can't change the fabric of reality. It's going to be a balancing act between employing solutions and building comprehension. Here's one of infinite ways that tech and UX frame accessibility. User research is an essential component to expanding compassion and knowledge, evolving comprehension, taking the same rigorous and scientific approaches to typical user research. Our principles inform design. These are high level things we believe in that are defined by the compassion and knowledge we learn. Guidelines are specific background knowledge documented. We have some of these in games already. Standards are rigorous and help maintain focus and more precisely defined solutions. In tech, they're often defined by a combination of laws, government, practice, and committees. In games, we have a habit of unofficial standards. Usually it's something popular in a game or it's something that's been done more than once. For accessibility, this could be our Achilles heel. All of these should be approached while undoing bias and realigning perspective. They aren't always, which is how we still get exclusion and harm in the tech industry as well. We could take some ideas here, but not necessarily all of them work for us. We are different. There's no standard game experience, so can we standardize? Or does it make sense to? Would this stop us before we got started? Maybe we could just standardize the fundamentals, you know, things like tech size. The fundamentals are a really small part of games accessibility. We have complex systems that are crafted to elicit feelings like challenge or triumph. Vast modes of interactivity with multiple inputs, cameras, interaction, everything. Then there's genres. Standardizing games accessibility is a minefield. And we need to be honest, we're still figuring it out. If we don't admit that, things will get locked in too soon. Principles are what we should be defining right now before we forge on. We need specialists for that, and we're extremely limited, unbelievably so for the size of our industry. Let alone the bandwidth to train people, it's a knowledge bottleneck. I'm super passionate about solving this, and I hope in a year or less I'll have something more concrete to report back on how we've been approaching our knowledge sharing, but for now, it's going to take a moment. Hang on, wait, what about QA and tracking or measuring accessibility? Well, we're mostly using checklist approaches across the industry. It's great to cover things we know we want to hit, such as certain levels of controls, color, or text accessibility. It works well with features and takes more training, knowledge, and a flexible approach for beyond that. But we should invest in that training. Working to check and track the level of accessibility beyond what the options there are and if the options aren't even needed, someone gets a high score, surely. We can't pass fail games accessibility, and that's really unique. May we never fall into the pit of web content accessibility guidelines, aka WCAG. I heard you like guidelines for your guidelines. There's guides for guidelines, documentation, techniques, and then more documentations and diagrams, and then documentations for how to navigate between the documentation. The web industry needs an exhaustive network of specialists, consulting firms, and people writing internal documentation and training just to use their guidelines. Thankfully, so far, our guidelines are lightweight. Although I have found they don't necessarily work for developers, especially on bigger teams with more specialization between roles. It's organized from player perspective and disability types, which means more specific designers don't know where to look for what they need to know. And in design, everything overlaps. There's no such thing as features for blind accessibility or deaf accessibility, etc. We could center those players in brainstorming solutions. Then we expand our view. This way we can avoid neglecting overlaps, conflicting barriers, and in the end, make more universal and likely less stigmatizing designs, especially being cautious of validation, validating with only one or two players. Our guidelines are strongest as knowledge libraries for specialists, producers, user researchers, and others with global transitional roles that need to learn from the biggest picture. I don't want to rework what we have because they're pretty good for their use. 
maybe a key for various disciplines to dip into, but I'm working closer to detailed design documentation. Design thinking can help us gently melt accessibility into existing processes. In games, we already have death by a thousand processes. Accessibility is a mindset shift that we apply to everything we do. The Nielsen Norman Group is a good starting point to learn about design thinking. There's more models from IBM and others adapting it to their needs. I wanted to adapt it for us. It's still a work in progress, but at Ubisoft, our teams have overlapping processes and central centralized production gates. Even so, there can be big differences on team structure and the day to day. This design thinking should fold in anywhere because it's dynamic and flexible. We move through the nodes, discovering, defining, designing, developing, constantly revisiting whenever we need. Just because you get to that develop stage doesn't mean you don't iterate. And when you do, make sure you go back to the relevant nodes. It turns with you at your pace like a wheel. Cross through the center regularly between listen and analyze for user research and to loop in specialist and design feedback, even as early as concept phases. Documentation anchors our mindsets. Highlighting accessibility considerations in your design docs ensures consistency and avoids overwriting critical decisions as you iterate. It's not just for designers. Design thinking helps us see how accessibility is everyone's responsibility and where we fit. It should also help with knowing when and how to grow your comprehension or when to reach for a specialist. Finally, the fun part. I'm very sad there's so little time for this, but maybe next year at GA, uh, next year's GA Conf I can finally do a fun talk, please. I hope so. Anyway, um, I don't know a single designer who can turn off their design brain. So quick, here's some shower thoughts. Ooh, navigation systems in Ghost of Tsushima. Players are frustrated when waypoints go away precisely for the reasons we want to throw them out. They're extremely visible, high contrast, and have long established purpose. Players head straight for them with little exploration. Whenever we move on from a widely used system, we take on a responsibility to teach players how to work without them and show them why. Waypoints actually come with pounds of accessibility problems anyway, so I'm excited for this opportunity as the industry try keeps trying to head this way. Ghost of Tsushima would have smashed it if they'd just taken it a little bit further. By comprehending a broader range of interaction experiences, such as low vision or cognitive experiences. The two levels of navigation systems is what got my system's brain excited. Can I say the word systems anymore? Oh my gosh, who wrote this? Um, the primary navigations are onboarded, maybe not definitively or repetitively enough. Follow the wind, the bird, the fox, etc. Taking the visibility and audio a little bit further, adding haptics and visual information for audio cues, the level of accessibility would have been profound by design. And oh my gosh, that's the exciting part. The cinema and the satisfaction. I'm actually sad that more couldn't experience that. These enhancements could have been optional, maybe the extreme ends, but imagine how much the universal player experience could have been improved too. Now the secondary systems were broader layer of establishing a new language, mostly for the player to figure out themselves. A lot of people didn't. Even going back to the wind, it wasn't just the animated cartoony visualization, the entire world moved and pointed. Not to mention the fox, the seasons, the tri gates, the sounds of bells and crickets. We can't underestimate the part of accessibility that's leading and teaching. I love Horizon Zero Dawn. Do I do? Everyone knows it. But the combat is literally systems of systems of systems of systems. And it's wonderful because it creates mind blowing player agency. That's chewy because I couldn't think of another adjective, but that's how it feels to me. One day I'm watching streamers play many different kinds and they all default to whacking the enemies with a stick. It's actually a spear. It's massively underpowered. And I'm guessing it's that way to discourage this kind of play. Ineffective and frustrating. They all ranted about hating the game. This could speak volumes for increasing understanding of our systems. With rigorous user research, we don't, without you, rigorous user research even, rigorous, vigorous, vigorous user research, my goodness, without rigorous user research, we don't know for sure, but it's a fun design exercise. 
Interestingly, there are multiple teaching methods and codexes. So maybe it's a lack of reinforcement or intensity of the moment. We need to broaden our understanding of cognitive and motor capabilities. The focus system is a beautiful example of a narrative gameplay feature that increases accessibility. The game depends on precision, as well as rapid flexibility in weapon, tool, and tactics, in high intensity and in high intensity encounters. The enemies become hard to impossible to beat without tactically targeting specific pieces of the armor with an elemental to boot. I really like writing myself tongue twisters today. Some are shielded even on top of that. These parts are hard to identify, engage, and when you engage focus, they're not only clearly highlighted, but you'll be able to see the weaknesses for the entire enemy. Disengage and the highlighting stays around for a fair amount of time to help with precision. Imagine the possibilities of leveraging systems like this for accessibility, especially if we focused on fundamentals like interface size and contrast and player's reaction and motor capabilities. Hey, I'm not gonna talk about The Last of Us Part 2's options. Although they were a huge achievement and opened so many doors, the listening feature is narratively bestowed on the player characters from the very first game. It resonated with me because it echoes some of the ways I leverage my sensory sensitivity thanks to my autism. It was also a crucial gameplay feature to enhance players' abilities to observe, plan, and execute complex tactics. This feature is a huge win for accessibility due to increasing visibility, allowing time and space to plan, identifying specific enemies and their patterns in high intensity encounters with low lighting, enhancing audio, prov providing visual, and it provided visual cues for audio cues. It goes on. Imagine what we can do if we realize the accessibility impacts. It is also how Naughty Dog took their high contrast, contrast mode from Uncharted 4. The fight pit, here we go. When it comes down to it, ultra hard games are a damn exciting design problem. There's a reason that so many systems designers who are huge fans of roguelikes or lights, souls likes, metroidvania, multiplayers, precision platforms, or even horror. The finesse, the balance, the challenge of challenging players. Mainstream games are now even influenced by these genres too. They're not incompatible with accessibility. Why? Because we make the rules. What the hell is challenge? What exactly do we want players to feel and experience? Lay everything out in the context of human interaction. Navigation is full of barriers in these genres. How do we increase accessibility but maintain the challenge even in non-combat systems? Interestingly, Deathloop Death has written narrative clues. It was flagged as an access barrier because of the text styling. I have another take. What if the stylization was to maintain and replicate the delicate challenges of path and clue finding while also increasing access to understanding, visibility, and discovery? Only the designers know for sure, but it's a great shower thought on how we could be designing gameplay accessibility solutions to mirror the challenges that we have in our games. In the Surge 2, <clears throat> the best Souls-like series, players can leave graffiti to help each other find their paths, hidden loot, rare stuff, or even hidden enemies or other danger. With player rating and a limit for how many you'll see, the griefing is actually non-existent. This reduces barriers in visibility, memorization, pathfinding, and cognitive loads. Even Bloodborne has two lovely community assist features, and this created a much healthier community around that game. Hades, do I need to explain? I just found this brilliant meme on Google and it says it all. Friendship ended with dying. Now God Mode is my best friend. Thanatus' face is scratched out with a giant red X. Let's clarify the takeaway on options real quick. We'll always need options because there's no universal experience. They can be powerful if we have a full picture. They are just options, not accessibility options. All options are for everyone and all options increase accessibility. When we silo, we reinforce stigma from elsewhere. We have research at Ubisoft that illustrates accessibility menus are confusing and much less usable in addition to the stigma. It doesn't have to go in an options menu even. Ensuring that customization is empowering and not stigmatizing is all in our approach. 
Imagine how we could take player customization and take it further and bring these features into game flow narratively. Unprecedented levels of immersion and the best feeling. Players feel like you made it just for them. This is the future I work for. Maybe we even need to evolve our options menus. They're kind of clunky now. Imagine modern usability features, player sorting, uh, players sorting, customizing, and bookmarking what they need. This is it. This is the slide. Uh, be intentional in everything and work to get the full picture. <laughs> I'm not cool enough to do a Faith No More uh, impression right now. <laughs> Everyone belongs in this party. Our roles are powerful AF. For designers, define, design, redefine. Our implementers, tech, show the designers the possibilities and your ideas are invaluable too. Together you stretch the limits. Facilitators, our producers, leads, QA and more. Make space for your teams and allow them to do what they do best. Don't be prescriptive and use checklists as hints for the roadmap, not the map itself. You keep us grounded. Researchers, apply our perspective shifts and principles. Usually, we avoid player suggestions by favoring observation and rigorous approach. Treat accessibility the same. Learn to identify barriers yourself and how to engage players so they can talk barriers and not feature requests. You bring us compassion. Consultants and advocates, nothing about us without us, invaluable. Avoid prescription and assumption on developers' intentions, priorities, and approach. Bring ideas into brainstorming by allowing designers to flex their expertise and take us to places we didn't even know we wanted or needed. The messengers, our media and content creators, how we discuss closes the circle. Today's prescriptive shift and the groundwork is for your work too. Everyone shapes the future. Never underestimate your impact and educational abilities. A boss key. Yes, games as a whole are for everyone. Not every game suits everyone. I want to work to get to a place where disabled players can make the same choices as any other player. Are they excluded because of an access barrier or do they simply get a chance to say, I don't like this game. We all, players, reviewers, experts, developers need to find the lines between what's an access barrier and what's truly part of the experience. This is ultimately what makes games accessibility more challenging than any other industry. Explicit communication to players helps define expectation. Hades says, you are going to die over and over. Get used to it. Here's what you can do. No matter where or who you are, questions are OP. The key to collaboration and moving everything toward a future we all want. This is how we, dis we solve for accessibility. And in the end, as Bryce said, we're not in the business of absolutes. This was a challenging talk and a challenging time. Never take the easy road, friends. In a recent meeting, a designer came forward about how terrible they felt for not considering other disabilities because they have dyslexia. And Clinton, half-coordinated Lexa, just popped up and said something so profound, I had to write it down. It's not what we didn't know yesterday, but what we do tomorrow with what we know now. Thank you for having me as always and see you soon. Yay, you did it, Cherry. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, an amazing talk as always. Um, and of course, Clinton, with your guest appearance and your talk uh, comment at the, the end of the slide, also amazing. There's so many things that I would love to highlight, but we, we can't, we don't have time. Um, whether it's uh, accessibilities, you know, a uh, frenemy relationship with standards on accessibility, um, you know, and our, our struggle with things like, I heard you like guidelines for your guidelines. But really, it's like Cherry said in this talk, accessibility is a mind uh, set shift. And that's what we have to work for. This was not a talk that is hard medicine to swallow, despite uh, Cherry's fears. It's a talk help to help all of us grow and take 
more steps forward as we intentionally think about the work that we are doing. So we are going to be taking uh, a, um, we're gonna take a two minute break. Um, so I know it's a little short, but we went a little over. So I will see you back in two minutes for our next talk. All right, I hope everyone was able to grab a quick drink or take a little bio break, whatever you needed. Uh, we are going to go ahead and go into our next talk, for, uh, which is communicating complex information through audio for blind flight simulator players. Today, we have the developers of Talking Flight Monitor, an accessibility add-on for mainstream flight simulators that makes this complex hobby accessible to totally blind players. And developing this one-of-a-kind solution, we needed to figure out how to convert very visual and complex aircraft systems into audio. They will discuss the decisions they made and their philosophy for building this software. Let's check it out. Hello everyone, my name is Jason Fair and I'm here with Andy Borka and we're here to talk about communicating complex visual information via audio for blind flight simulator users. So I, the first thing that people are often wonder is as a blind person, Andy and I are both totally blind and why would we be interested in flight simulation? Because flight simulation is you know, inherently a very visual activity, um, you know, lots of awesome scenery and various things like that. But there are actually quite a few people uh, that are blind or low vision that are quite interested in this hobby. And the reasons can can range from just, 
you know, a general interest in aviation. I mean, you know, most of us have been on airplanes, but, you know, some people want to know, well, how does this all work? What's, what are the, what are the processes and procedures as, you know, as people are flying? So that's part of it. And the other thing is people just want to experience what it's like to be in the cockpit of a modern airliner. Several years ago, we could actually do that. We could, you know, we could possibly get, you know, if we asked, uh, we could possibly get into the cockpit, cockpit of a plane, uh, but that definitely doesn't happen anymore. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of, of flight simulation accessibility. And then I'm going to pass it over to Andy and Andy's going to talk about the talking flight monitor software that we've, uh, that we've developed. So a little bit of background, um, as I said earlier, Andy and I are both totally blind. Uh, we've been in the technology field for quite a long time. And for a blind person to use a computer, um, typically we would be using a piece of software called a screen reader. Uh, for Windows, the two major ones are a package called JAWS, J-A-W-S for Windows, or NVDA, uh, Non-Visual Desktop Access. And in the, the most basic terms, a screen reader takes the information that's happening on the computer screen and converts that into audible speech. So if I'm in a Word document, I can you know, browse around and, and read. If I'm, you know, I can read my email, I can read the web. Um, when we start talking about things like flight simulation though, we have to do some pretty uh, creative things to, to make that work. So, so history of flight simulation. So uh, as far as accessibility, um, flight simulators are not accessible really in any way. Um, with Microsoft FSX or Lockheed Martin uh, prepared, you can load up the system and use the screen reader to, you know, get the plane, you know, select your aircraft, select your location as far as an airport. But then once the, once the simulation starts, um, there's, there's really nothing. You can't access the menus, you can't read the gauges, you can't do anything. So what we've needed to do over the years is come up with creative ways of getting access to this information. So the very first piece of software that I was aware of that did, uh, that gave us access to flight simulation was something called FS Navigator. And this was around in somewhere around 2004. And this gave us access to uh, FS 2004 and I believe one earlier version. Um, pretty basic, you could, you could control the aircraft autopilot through a moderately accessible interface. It wasn't designed to be accessible, but it just sort of was. Um, and so, you know, you could, you could take off, you could fly around, you couldn't really, you, well, you could follow a flight plan, um, you know, if the plan was loaded into your autopilot and you could maybe land, but probably not. Um, if, if you were very lucky, you, you, <laughs> you might be able to land. So in, tw in 2010, this is when the uh, sort of fairly large leap forward came in, uh, in access to flight simulation. And this is a product called It's Your Plane, which was produced by a gentleman in uh, British Columbia. And this was a speech um, enabled access to flight simulation. So it was actually, it was all voice activated. And this was really quite amazing for its time. Um, provided access to many aircraft systems. You could request, you know, you know, request altitude and speed and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, the problem though, is that it's your plane stopped development and it was a lot of its, a lot of its features were online. So when the software was shut down, it just went away entirely. You couldn't access it online. You couldn't use it offline uh, because it was dependent on its servers that didn't exist anymore. So that was unfortunate. Um, 2013, we had something called FSX Pilot, which is um, another piece of software that allows some access to uh, the aircraft autopilot systems. Uh, but on a, again, a fairly limited way you could fly Flight plans, uh, the, the, the flight plans that you would use with it are somewhat proprietary. 
and it didn't actually control the aircraft's built-in autopilot. It actually took over from, uh, from that aircraft autopilot. Um, the next one that we used up until relatively recently is something called FS Tramp. And FS Tramp was a um, sort of a spin-off from FS Navigator. I believe they used a lot of the same code base. And this was a package that allowed us to do quite a lot. Um, we could somewhat accessibly read um, airport information. We could read descriptions of SIDs and stars. Um, you know, through the FS Tramp interface, but it, it had its it had its share of issues, and so we we need another solution. So, in 2019, um, I started developing Talking Flight Monitor, and um, Andy joined the project in 2020, uh, I believe July of 2020. Um, Talking Flight Monitor honestly started off as a small Python project to see if I could find the closest city to your aircraft and read out using text-to-speech what it was. That really is all it started as. And we, we, it, it snowballed in an unbelievable hurry. Um, once the community realized that we, we could get that information, people started asking, well, can you do this? Can you read altitude? Can you read um you know any other aircraft systems um so ta so talking flight monitor started in may 2019 and it's as you'll see here very soon um it has has grown into something quite huge tfm has a bunch of different features most of them are either speech-based, braille-based, or audio-based. And we're going to cover some design principles uh, that we have created in order to make these features come into place. Um, the first one is keyboard shortcuts. TFM has over 70 keyboard shortcuts. And these do several different things and are presented in different ways. Um, all TFM features are accessed through these keyboard shortcuts. They're listed in a user interface, uh, so they're easy to reference for the user or even we need to reference them sometimes. They're global to TFM. Uh, this avoids complex navigation issues through different menu systems and different screens. They're consistent. Um, for an example, uh, TFM has two different main hotkeys. Uh, one is left TFM, which is the autopilot uh, features TFM. The right side is the main panels or the main instruments that you would access like altitude, speed, heading. Uh, keep keyboard meaningful for the user. Um, for an example, a generally means altitude, S usually means speed, H heading, and so on. Um, you can easily control altitude, autopilot altitude, speed, and all of its various features uh, with simple keyboard navigation. Um, this translates to group related UI elements in the same group. For an example, all of the autopilot speed controls are generally located in a single window. Uh, same thing with heading and altitude. Um, another feature is TFM is self voicing, which means it puts out speech by itself without the use of a screen reader. Uh, this will provide a fail safe so the user does not lose control of the system, even when their accessibility features on their system fail. It prevents critical information from getting lost. For an example, localizer and glide slope uh, when we're talking about landing in an airplane is critical. Ground speed is essential for takeoff. FMC messages, which the onboard computer will propagate messages that are critical that usually indicate 
uh, misconfiguration or an error somewhere. And it also provides different speech output options for the user, because not everyone may or may not want to use a screen reader. Uh, again, as I said above, the option to use a screen reader, it works with NVDA on visual desktop access, JAWS, job access with speech, Windows Narrator, and others that are not uh, more commonly used, such as Serotech or Nova. Uh, the next one, uh, Audible and speech output for manual uh, flight controls. It provides a system for the user to be aware of spatial uh, navigation and position. Uh, examples are pitch, altitude, angle, uh, bank. And it provides uh, further customization of output modes. Um, the next slide. Replacement user interface. Um, in some cases, we have to replace the user interface of certain aircraft uh, because they're not accessible. Uh, for an example, some of the payware aircraft that we have been working on lately needs a complete accessible redesign. Um, one thing we had find out uh, is you need to replace the existing inaccessible user interface when a simple keyboard shortcut or joystick button will not suffice. Too many keyboard shortcuts or joystick buttons are required to perform a task. It's impossible to represent the task or job without a user interface. It increases immersion of the uh, of the game when in designing accessible user interfaces keep it as close to the original as possible mirroring accessible design with an inaccessible user interface allows disabled users to explore other tutorials and how-to guides that other non-disabled people use Get involved in user groups, forums, or other discussions without modifications. Just as a quick example of what Andy was talking about, in the 737 and 730, uh, sorry, 737 and 777 payware planes that we wrote interfaces for, the flight management computer that we implemented, basically it's, it's using their software development kit, we were able to implement the flight management computer and our accessible interface is almost identical to the visual interface that somebody would see on screen. It's just, it's fully accessible. So somebody can, can watch a tutorial that talks about how to program the flight management computer and using our interface, they can mimic exactly what's going on in that YouTube video that's designed for, for side view, uh, sighted users. Talking Flight Monitor can be found at www.talkingflightmonitor.com. If you wish to reach us through email, the email address is info, I-N-F-O, at talkingflightmonitor.com. Thank you for joining our presentation. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you so much for that talk. For me, I am not a flight sim player. And so he, knowing how much um, literally things there are to do um, is kind of overwhelming, but I think it calls out an amazing point that you guys had, that the work that you did for your accessible interface was essentially the same as the interface for sighted players. Again, meaning that they could follow any of those tutorials out there for this complex process and be able to accomplish it without anyone needing to generate uh, you know, new information, which uh, makes it so much easier for these blind players to be able to use it when they can use all of the information 
already out there to be able to enjoy flight simulators. So great work. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to be taking a, a five minute break. We will be back at 2.20 and we'll be having our next talk, How Being Disabled Prepared Me for a Career in QA. See you shortly.
All right. I hope everyone had a nice break. Our next talk is how being disabled prepared me for a career in QA. Ad adaptation and thinking outside the box are key skills for anyone in quality assurance. It just so happens that living with a disability grows and cultivates those skills naturally. Let's check it out. Hey everyone, welcome to my apartment in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, my name is Phil Wallace. I am a senior QA analyst at Epic Games on the Unreal Engine team. Uh, and my talk today is a little bit called How Being Disabled Prepared Me for a Career in QA. Uh, some quick facts about me. I was born September 28, 1983 in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I graduated high school in 2002 and uh, graduated from Virginia Tech uh, in, in 2007. Uh, I have 11 years of experience in the gaming industry as a as QA and an associate producer. Uh, I'm a self-taught programmer, uh, C, C++, C Sharp, Python. I got my start programming back in the early 2000s on MUDs. Uh, and I sort of just kept the the hobby as it as it grew and as new pro, you know uh, languages came out. Uh, and like I said, currently I'm a senior QA analyst on the Unreal Engine team uh, on the foundation pillar. I deal with the cooker and packaging and all of those uh, low level things that really are important for making sure that people can publish their games on the Unreal Engine. So. Some things that I've worked on in my career, I've worked for EA Mythic, which was my first job. I worked for Bethesda and the, for five years, High Res Studios for about four and a half years, and now I'm at Epic, uh, which I've been here for all over a year. Um, I've worked you know, I, on the screen are a couple of projects that I've worked on, uh, Dishonored, Skyrim, Fallout 4, Fallout New Vegas, and of course, the Unreal Engine. I was born with cerebral palsy. Um, so cerebral palsy is a disability often uh, that comes about at birth due to brain damage or injury. Um, symptoms of it are poor coordination, stiff muscles, high muscle spasticity, uh, tremors, sometimes seizures. Um, there are often uh, very uh, issues with senses and motor skills. Uh, and other related functions of the body. Um, they, babies with CP are often development, developmentally dis, dis, excuse me, developmentally delayed, um, where we crawl or walk uh, much later than most children do. Or in my case, we don't walk independently at all. Um, I walk with crutch, forearm crutches, uh, which necessitate are necessitated because my balance is very poor. Um, and I use them to basically just get around and ambulate on my own. Um, it was caused, like I said, by brain damage at birth uh, into mostly for me in areas of uh, motor control and balance in my brain. So what's this have to do with QA? Well, there's, it can be summed up really in one word, tools. Tools are an important part of the evolution of a creature, of, a, of an animal or a creature. Um, oftentimes, when we are looking at the in, the intelligence of an animal, we use the use of tools as a factor of how intelligent they are. Animals that use tools: apes, crows, dolphins, elephants, sea otters, octopi are a very common one. Um, they all use objects in their environment to do various tasks more efficiently. And humans, of course, are really, really good at using tools. We've created our own, you know, starting back in the Stone Age when we first started hitting rocks together uh, and created our first stone tools. 
uh, and progressed through, you know, the Bronze Age and, and uh, smelting and smithing metal up until, you know, today we use computers and uh, cars and all sorts of other tools to make our lives easier. In nature, adaptation is survival. If you can't adapt to your environment, you don't survive. That's the, that is one of the most critical things uh, a species can be able to do is to adapt to new conditions and new stimuli in the environment. Being disabled um, really is a life of adaptation and adaptation builds independence. We, as a disabled person, it means that I live in a world that is largely not built for me in mind. Um, it, there are obviously rules and laws that specify that there must be this many handicapped spaces or ramps or accessibility features. But for the most part, buildings and structures and all these different things in life that we come on a daily day to day basis are not built for disabled people with disabilities, whether it's a physical disability, whether you're deaf, whether you are, um, you know, any other sort of limitation, the world is not built for us. It's not built in a way that is easy for us to access. So in order to remain independent, we have to adapt to this environment that is built differently for them from what would be easier for us. Uh, and the way we do this, or one of the quickest ways we do this is by tools. We find new and useful ways to use existing objects outside their normal functions uh, to do everyday tasks. Um, it makes adaptation quicker and it makes us able to interact with our environment more efficiently uh, without having to reinvent the wheel or reinvent something new and specialized that we uh, would need in, otherwise, in other words to function. Um, a good example of a tool that I use all the time, uh, I use tongs to extend my reach. If I, I, I can't bend over to pick up objects uh, off the ground, my flexibility is not that good. So oftentimes if I drop something on the floor and I need to grab it, I have a pair of tongs that, is, that are nearby that I use to pick things up off the floor. Um, another example is, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine was over one day and I dropped a piece of paper on the floor. And before they even could move to try and grab it, I just used my crutches like a, like a pair of chopsticks or tongs to pick the paper up off the floor and put it back on the table. And the rather bewildered look that I got from my friend was really um, entertaining because they didn't expect me to do that with my crutches. They, they didn't think of my crutches in such a way that they could be used for anything but walking. So I like to tell people to be like Alton Brown, say no to unitaskers. He really hates objects that only have one function. Uh, the only unitasker he has in his uh, kitchen, he says, is the fire extinguisher. And I believe he even found a use for one of those, a second use for one of those too. So unitaskers are not very useful to, uh, to people with disabilities. If, if they only serve one purpose, then it can't be used as a tool to, to extend and improve our lives. Uh, so going back to QA, you know, we run test suites, we run test plans, we run all of these structured, uh, structured uh, paths of testing to ensure that, that we are getting the most coverage on the most systems in the most efficient way possible. But really it's when you combine or use systems in new, unique or unexpected ways that we get some of the best bugs. Um, you know, it's, we, the, a lot of times systems are built a certain way without the anticipation that a user is going to use them in a completely unexpected way. And that method is just not handled, um, which causes a bug and causes unexpected behavior or unintended behavior. Um, and, you know, so as QA, our job is to think about how a system or feature is supposed to work and then do the exact opposite. It's, and that's something I tell testers when I teach them uh, very often that what we want to do is test all of the obvious situations first and then do the unexpected. Do 
something that is clearly unintended and see how it handles it because it very well could break. So I'm going to just quote from somebody who I look up to, uh, Raf Koster, you know, from his theory of fun. He says, people are amazing pattern uh, matching machines. Um, and like I said, nobody can anticipate every single use case. We're human. We, all, we only can only think of, you know, such, you know, the majority of use cases. But I always tell people, there is always somebody who is smarter or more clever than you out there who's going to find something you didn't find. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't find it as QA testers, but it does mean that it's going to happen. It, it, there, there is always, there's a, it's the, like the quote from Star Wars, there's always a bigger fish. Somebody out there is going to find something that you didn't find. Um, and we have to be aware of that, but we also have to be, mitigate that, that circumstance. Sometimes um, the best bugs we find are ones we find when we do something that's not expected or, or when we do something um, unintended or, you know, combine things in different ways. And the thing, the, one of the other things I teach people is bugs are tools too. You know, we should use them. We should take bugs and the experience we have finding bugs uh, and apply them to other systems. At, at an underlying level, there may be several systems that run very similarly that may exhibit the same bugs, right? Look for patterns, um, take the bugs that you find elsewhere uh, and, and apply them to these patterns and be that pattern matching machine um, that, 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 that we excel at as humans. Um, and ultimately when all else fails, smash the feature against the proverbial rock. It worked out for our answers, right? Uh, it's just, it's very important that at the end of the day, as QA, we are adaptable and we take the things that we are given to test and we adapt them in new and unique and interesting ways. It, that's, that's what my whole life has been as, as a disabled person. It has, it's been a life of adaptation, a life of looking at objects and looking at tool, things in different ways. How can I use this as a tool? How can I use this in another way to uh, improve my life or to make my life easier or to make it more efficient? Um, that's what we do as QA. And the best QA testers I've found are the people who can take those principles of adaptation and using things in different unique ways and apply them to their testing methods to find the weird or esoteric or interesting bugs that may come up. Um, my contact information, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, at, you know, at LinkedIn slash in dot Phil dot dash Wallace. Uh, I'm very happy to network with people. Um, uh, some citations here, uh, just from where I got my two quotes, the one about syrup palsy, and of course the theory of fun from Raph Coster. Um, and I have some special thanks here for the people who have really made this possible for me. Uh, to not only be here today talking, but also just to have made it through the gaming industry for 11 years. Um, it's, it's really amazing the support that I've been given from the many different people on this slide. Um, that being said, thank you very much for listening to my talk. Um, I hope you learned something new or thought about something new, and I look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you so much for that talk. I uh, I was laughing when you were talking about your crutches, not because you were picking up a piece of paper, but because Poppy in chat was <laughs> was also laughing because they said they do the exact same thing with their crutches. But really that whole story was great. Talking about how using crutches to pick up paper and people being surprised because you were using them not in the way they were intended, but taking that same problem solving and bringing it to testing and using things and existing systems in an unexpected way that causes a bug. And I wanna highlight how much work, creativity and ingenuity it really takes to work in quality assurance. I could give my own 12 hour talk on why QA is undervalued in the game industry and they need further in 
development, but that's probably for another conference. With that, we are going to be taking our long afternoon break. This is going to be um, just under a half hour. And so, no, a half hour, exactly, just kidding. Uh, I will see you in 30 minutes, please. Uh, be sure to be posting all of your great pictures in the pets channel, show us your clothing, clothing in show us your threads uh, or browse the Redbubble store for any merch that you're wanting to pick up. I'll see you guys after that.
I hope everyone had a good afternoon break. I can't believe that we're into the final quarter of the day. Again, I can't believe how fast it's going. So our next talk is Beginner's Mindset, Accessibility Testing with Far Cry 6. Whether you're new to user research or an experienced researcher who has yet to dip their toes into accessibility, this talk is meant to help you feel more comfortable running your first user test with disabled players. Follow our journey, and our meaning Ubisoft's, follow Ubisoft's journey as they set up, recruited for, and ran accessibility tests for Far Cry 6 at Ubisoft's Montreal User Research Lab. Are you really excited about this one, Leon? Oh, he's purring, so I guess so. All right, let's get to it. Hello everyone, my name is Ashley Papineau. I'm a user research moderator with Ubisoft Montreal. I am a dark-skinned woman in my early 30s with black curly hair wearing a purple sweater. Um, so I apologize in advance for the speed of this talk, but we have a lot to get through. So without further ado, um, I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll have an understanding of what it was like learning about accessibility from functionally zero knowledge. Um, I hope to detail for you how we had to evolve our traditional testing process to accommodate players with disabilities. And I want to leave you with some key takeaways describing what we learned along the way and how that affects our future research. To be honest, I actually struggled to write this talk because at first I felt obligated to share like just the process of running the test, but that's not the whole picture of how we prepared. For much of the team, this was a pretty emotional journey. journey. Um, I'll even share like on my next slide uh, what this was like. Also, I want to take a note here that uh, there will be no test results shared, but I will share some stories about uh, our players. And I hope that at the end of this, you come away feeling empowered to learn about accessibility and then confident in testing your products and services as we researchers uh, iterate on our approach to, to this test process. So here's how the story started. Uh, we got a message from our manager stating that Ubisoft Kiv wanted to uh, do an accessibility test for Far Cry 6. And uh, the manager shared some resources like how to interact with players with disabilities, um, some general good practices and etiquette, the do's and don'ts. Um, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. Um, you have to understand that this was the first accessibility test of its kind at the Montreal Lab. So prior, we had done some stuff with information architecture. We had looked at color blindness. Um, that was before I started there. Um, but now we were going to be looking at game mechanics. We were going to be looking at menu options. And uh, so, so it was our first time diving into that. And my personal feelings on the matter, I felt super nervous. Like I was very new to user research at the time. I had only been working in the lab for two months. Uh, so I wasn't sure if I had the expertise to be able to take on this new topic. At the same time, I also have a disability, but it's largely invisible. Um, so even if I did learn about accessibility, I wasn't sure if I could like uh, advocate like correctly for disabled players. Um, and so I had to remember my experience from earlier in 2020. Uh, you see, I'm a black woman who was very privileged to grow up in Toronto, largely diverse city. Um, and I did not knowingly encounter racism in my life. So when George Floyd died and it led to this global movement, um, it turns out that there were a lot of people color, uh, people of color like me who felt the same way. And that event had forced us to, to, to learn about systemic racism. And that's a really heavy topic. And it didn't lose anything from, from diving into that. So acknowledging this part uh, of my identity and my ignorance of it, um, it, it gave me the space to not gatekeep myself and say, oh, like I'm not disabled enough to advocate for accessibility and to learn about this community. So I took from that in, in order to, to learn about disability and accessibility in the first place. And, uh, and so uh, with the support of my manager, I was able to put together a very basic presentation. This is like, what is disability? What is accessibility? Why do we care about it? What are different internal resources that we have in the lab? And then I shared it with my coworkers. And that's how we all collectively started. We, we thought about internal documentation and talks that did exist. Um, and we had to do this while balancing our responsibilities with other user tests. Um, you know, we 
had to we had to sort of consume what we had available and then after that uh, we were able to move on to the greater internet and this is where you're able to type in the really basic like super basic queries like what's the difference between disabled person or a person with a disability how do you talk to to people with disabilities you know what do they consider offensive uh, you know we we had to be curious during this time and it turns out online there's like a ton of resources like you can look up specific interest groups you can look at universities government offices articles from the news articles from student newspapers um you know looking at tweets about our games that was really illuminating and uh and once you start getting your bearing in this space that's when you can start looking out for best practices and industry benchmarks so to my knowledge as of the time of this recording september 2021 uh we don't have a formal thing like WCAG for web developers uh but we do have a lot of wonderful resources that are starting to form those pillars for us those those good practices so we could look at sites like can i play that or we could look at daggers reviews on our games for instance uh so this is this is how we got started understanding uh understanding games and accessibility and it also required this lens shift overall we had grown up in society being familiar with oh like disability that you're disabled when you have a medical condition and it's like no 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 it's not about disability caused by medical conditions we need to think about disability as um as being excluded from interactions and from experiences because of environmental barriers that interfere with your day-to-day -day enjoyment of life and we were working on a video game so we had the control of these environmental barriers or at least some control anyway we were working to make and test this game um, to reduce these environmental barriers as much as possible we also started to understand the framework that we use for accessibility barriers in games and it does have limitations so again uh, as of as of the time of recording you know we can classify barriers into these different umbrellas and sort of address them through visual hearing mobility cognitive and speech accessibility and uh and uh, i'll reflect later why this doesn't fully work all the time uh, but never mind the subject matter, we also had to develop a safe space for discussion. So, um, you know, I'll never forget the feeling uh, that, that I felt when I watched someone play Assassin's Creed with a quad stick for the first time. You know, the controller that you use your mouth, your teeth, your tongue, your breath to control. Um, I had a coworker who shared a, a video of a disabled player, you know, they were playing a game and they thought it was really cool. And then I had a different coworker who watched the same video and felt kind of ill because they were thinking about how different that player's experience was from their own. And so all the documentation tells you that it's rude to react with pity or with awe directly to people with disabilities. And that makes complete sense. I mean, like, so if you're telling someone, oh, you're so brave, like, that's really being condescending to a fellow human being with a lived experience that is different from your own. Um, but I'm here to tell you that such feelings are normal. They happen. It takes time to rewire what society has put in us, how we perceive disability. You have to build that resilience. You have to train through exposure, if you will. Um, and if you're a UX practitioner, you know that empathy is essential uh, to this field. And you have to you have to sort of adjust to understand that disabled players are going to be the experts on their own experience. And it's not up to us to assume their feelings and then empathize with those assumptions, if that makes sense. So we had established all this base knowledge and we were now ready to move on to a process that we call needs gathering. So what is needs gathering? It's uh, This is a very simplified way of looking at it, but if you think about like the elementary school, who, what, where, when, why, and how of the test, these are the sorts of details that get sussed out between the production team and then uh, the professionals in our lab. So we're able to define together, okay, what exactly is the content that needs testing and why, and then move on to the greater details. So when is the test taking place? Who are we going to be testing with? Where is the test going to happen? And then how are we going to run the test and then report back uh, with our findings? So thankfully, we have an in-house accessibility team that's able to 
to help us define these sorts of difficult research questions, uh, make them simpler and approachable. And uh, so we weren't doing this alone, which uh, we were very grateful for. Um, and so we arrived on two areas, the first being options menus. So are players able to customize the game? How easy or hard is that to do? And do players understand how the options affect the game? Uh, and so this is where we started to realize, we hadn't fully learned it yet, but we started to understand that all options accept, uh, affect accessibility, even if that's not the original design intent. So that's something we're starting to digest a bit. The second area is gameplay accessibility. So do players still face barriers while using the options? Do they struggle in moving Danny around, whether, whether you know, this main character, are they on foot? Are they in a vehicle? Are they riding a horse? Um, can they do the diff uh, use the different in-game menus? So I'm talking about like where you manage your inventory, your quests, your collectibles. Um, and then even with all that happening, are they able to still follow the story? Can they understand what's happening? We next have to look at when we could test. So yes, this does mean the dates, uh, when was it going to take place, but also what approach to testing were we going to take? So there are two general approaches to accessibility research that we've been able to define for ourselves. The first is ongoing research, and the second is accessibility focus solely. So ongoing research is really lovely. It, it seeks feedback from players across the uh, entire development cycle. Uh, if you're integrating, let's say, a disabled player on your traditional test that would normally include uh, just non-disabled players. And the main advantage to this is that you do catch problems earlier. You're able to find the very obvious glaring issues and then later on in the process if you do just a test with disabled players you can like experiment with some really interesting solutions and and have like a cohort focused just on that so that is the second focus the, the accessibility focus is is really great for uh, checking compliance you know when you have here is a list of things that uh, that you know that we're measuring against and then here's how the content actually measures up against that. Um, so so that, that was the approach that we were going to be taking for this uh, test because the game was at a state where much of the features had been locked in. Um, so this was the way for us to support the team and we started out knowing that this would be more of a validation process. Excuse me. Um, so ultimately blending these approaches leads to deeper insights like the way I mentioned before. You can find the low hanging fruit early, you can address it with really creative solutions, and you can test those solutions down the line in accessibility focused testing. We were focusing on just accessibility focused testing to make sure that we could check the standards of accessibility in our game. Next, we had to look at who we were testing with. This is what we call defining the player profiles. So as much as we wanted, we couldn't test with all kinds of disabled players in one test. That's just impossible. Uh, we ended up uh, choosing for our first test, we worked with players who had low vision or minor motor disabilities. And in the second test, we worked with players who were hard of hearing or deaf. So if I'm going to illustrate for you why we have to restrict the scope so much, let's think about players who maybe have motor disabilities, okay, uh, who encounter mobility barriers in games. Um, so if we're th if we're sort of thinking about uh, if we're sort of thinking about the types of players that would fit into that category, um, this may include wheelchair users. This could also include uh, someone who has one hand. This could also include someone who experiences pain and stress because they're repeatedly like mashing buttons on a controller. Um, so you can tell already, okay, we started out with the minor motor disability group or the motor disability group, but there are already at least three different types of players that fit into that category and they're all wildly different from each other. And so this is why we have to make sure we restrict the scope to make sure we can uh, prevent against that, that muddy data if we're like testing with, you know, all the subsets are so diverse. Okay, let's not test with a ton of different um, types of barriers all at once. <laughs> we also have to consider, is this going to be a remote test or is this going to be in person? Uh, so uh, in-person testing would have been uh, the most authentic experience. People love coming into, their, into our lab, but we are under-equipped. We do not have all the possible types of hardware or software to accommodate uh, disabled players coming in. 
And honestly, going to people's homes would have been lovely because it's their ideal setup. They're at home. Um, but the COVID-19 pandemic prevented that. And so because of this pandemic, we were pushed to find flexible solutions and remote testing. We you know, technically had a global pool of candidates as long as their time zone was more or less okay, uh, close to ours. And uh, and also uh, doing a proper technical setup would have been essential. So we needed to make sure that the assistive technology that they may or may not have been using, it was going to work with Parsec. That was the platform that we were using at the time for our remote testing. So we've gone through all the different parameters for the test. And now we're going to focus on starting this whole process. We have to recruit our participants. Our recruitment process uh, starts with an initial outreach that takes the form of an email, like a, a sort of blast uh, to all the all the potential candidates, if you will. Um, so with this email blast, we sent a survey. Uh, I'll explain more on the next slide. Um, but this was our typical process. We used our internal recruitment database, um, and we were considering that social definition of disability. We were recruiting based on the barriers that were experienced by players, and we were not recruiting for specific medical conditions. That said, we ran out of players really quickly. Um, so social media was indeed useful for us. Uh, we had to make use of Twitter's very active uh, accessibility community to, to sort of fill up our roster. Along with this initial email, like I said, we mentioned a survey that listed in a sort of, you know, check off all that apply manner, what were the barriers that they experienced when they played video games. And finally, this process did take a lot of time. Um, we needed more time than usual to recruit. Honestly, a month would have been ideal because there are many different types of moving pieces here uh, from the technical aspects to how many, how many different people are we gonna be talking to. So also more, uh, more on that very shortly. But like I said, we sent a survey and, and it took the form of check off all that apply and we had questions for uh, those who experienced visual barriers, for mobility, for hearing. Um, so some examples of some visual barriers, for instance, is I have difficulty perceiving the different elements on a screen, or I find it difficult to see text on the screen, interface, menu, subtitles, etc. And all these statements had to be approved by the legal department. Um, I, I've learned since then that different companies, uh, they may ask participants about the disabilities that they do have in combination with barriers, um, just for, um, for record keeping purposes. But we stuck to barriers as much as possible. So um, as it turned out, while we were not actively seeking out uh, players with uh, disabilities in the medical sense, the result of this approach was that uh, the vast majority of players we did recruit did also have uh, disabilities. But you'll find out shortly why asking about the barriers mattered. Um, so also we, we did have some accessibility influencers that we got from social media, um, and we did not have to send them this list. We did not have to screen them further because they had been more than transparent about what their experiences uh, were like playing video games with disability. We knew what profile we were going to assign them to in the end. So we start out with that initial email, and then our database uh, now consists of players who have fit the pre-screening criteria. And so now we need to follow up with a phone, or in some cases, email screen. This is where we double check their availability, we make sure that their uncle doesn't work at Nintendo, and we ask if they use any sorts of assistive technology. So the standard interview plus some modifications. Um, we were also very open to recruiting players who were curious about first-person shooters, but they never had the opportunity to try because of the lack of accommodation for their disability. Uh, so we were, we were willing to take on beginners in the genre uh, who had always wanted to, to play uh, but couldn't. Also, sometimes you'll get players that misunderstand the screening questions, which is hilarious. Um, so for example, we did have one player who uh, claimed that they experienced uh, visual barriers uh, when they were playing video games. But then in the phone call, we found out that they wore glasses and um, that more or less corrected any visual impairment they had. So it's like, okay, we're not looking for you. Um, but it was still, it was still really funny. So this is the, the reason why we have this two-step process to screening our candidates. 
once they succeed, once we find out that they're going to be a good fit, fit we go into the technical setup. And I highly recommend doing your technical setup with a game that largely mirrors uh, what, uh, you're what you're testing. Um, so it made sense, okay, this is for Far Cry 6. We're going to be testing with Far Cry New, we're going to be doing the, the, uh, the technical test with Far Cry New Dawn because the features line up pretty closely. If anything, the accessibility in Far Cry 6 is going to be better. You, you know, this is what we could closely expect on the first day of the test. Also, uh, pro tip, interpreters are amazing for hard of hearing and deaf candidates. I highly recommend having an interpreter on standby because it helps to expedite the process and ensure that you have enough time with your players instead of you know, typing these questions back and forth and back and forth. So once they succeed in the technical setup, uh, you know, everything's gone well. Now we can uh, hook them up with the pretest paperwork. So this is stuff like the non-disclosure agreements, the rewards, the payment forms, any other documentation. Um, so everything needs to be legible, it needs to be screen reader friendly and high contrast. Um, and then if there are going to be caregivers or helpers that are present during the test, they too need to promise not to help the candidate uh, with with the material they're testing, and then also sign non-disclosure agreements. Also, we have a standard welcome presentation that we do on the first day of our tests, and we still did plan to do this, but we also adapted it in the same way, screen reader friendly, you know, uh, large text, high contrast, and all that, and we did send it out in advance just to reduce the amount of, of stress that uh, the participants might experience, just to make sure that everything was easy to digest. We had our recruits and now we could get ready ourselves for this process. So the way that moderators uh, prepared, like myself, uh, we continued to use our check-in process, you know, to sort of feel our emotions as we went. Uh, we revised what our etiquette would be with our disabled players. So this is where all the Google research with like the really basic questions that you think are dumb. It's like, no, 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 no. These are, this is where that kicks in. This is where it helps. And um, we learned some really interesting, uh, interesting ways to interact with our players. So for example, um, one that you may have heard is forget the word normal. If you're going to compare types of players or mention players, you can use the terms disabled or non-disabled instead. Or let's say we're falling behind and we need to like move things along. Something that we have a habit of saying is in the interest of time, we're going to yada yada. Um, but uh, we didn't want the players to feel, oh, like because of my disability, I'm like holding up this test and I'm ruining it. And we want, because that wasn't true at all. Uh, and we didn't want them to mistakenly think that. So instead of saying in the interest of time, we would say instead, I have everything I need for this task. Now we're going to move on to etc. We also had to play the build uh, and consult the design information that was provided to us by the team. So they provided us with a list of here are all the different menu functions, here is how they're uh, expected to work, and uh, you know on the other hand we also tried certain exercises in simulating the, uh, the conditions of our players. So for instance, I, I know that there are like glasses that you can buy that simulate low vision, um, or you can, you know, take off your headset if you're trying to pretend to be deaf and play without sound. But you know, let's be real, that's not the same thing at all. We are not living with that experience every day. So it did give us a little bit of an idea of what to expect, but it wasn't adequate by any means. Also, um, you know, those in charge of uh, designing the test, they made sure that the moderation guide was light and structured with ample breaks. So our moderation guide, it tells us exactly what the script is for the test and had little interesting tips about uh, about what to expect, about where to be attentive. So we did this in a way that it would be, again, reducing stress, reducing how much to think about what's happening. We want to make it as light as possible. Next, we had to run a pilot test. So this was a half day practice run of the test. We did it with participants who were going to be in the actual test because we, we did not succeed in recruiting additional players just for the pilot. Um, we took them from the actual test group because it's really important to do the pilot with players who fit 
the same profile as your as your test group. Um, so, for example, uh, this reveals any sort of modifications that need to be made to the moderation guide. You know, and this is where we found out for the first time that our uh, our our procedure fell short. You know, so we had a player who was in our in our in our low vision group, and we had to send them home. They they were they were an amazing player, but they were. Uh, they were unable to get through the content of the game. Okay, why did this happen? So uh, looking at this player, this player was really excellent in giving uh, feedback and speaking aloud. Um, you know, they, but, but the problem was, is that our framework for considering, oh, they're part of the low vision group, you know, it, it wasn't adequate because it was possible, we suspect, that this player also had some sort of cognitive uh, disability and the protocol wasn't accommodating this likely intersection of disabilities here you know also uh, we didn't do the technical setup with the player we did it with the person helping them and that person uh, that player was also not doing the test from home they were doing it from a local community center in like an isolated space um, so the tech setup went exactly as planned with the helper, but not with the participant. In any case, uh, it, it still, this whole process helped to build confidence for the team. This is why you need to run the pilot test. This is why you need to have a check-in process. Like, I just felt so upset uh, saying to this player, I'm sorry, you can't continue. This is why we have to check in with each other. So now we get to move on to actually running the test. There are various activities that we can give to our participants. We start with the formal welcome meeting as scheduled, even though we sent it out in advance because this is a great way to like build unity, build closeness. Uh, and then we let them have the game. You know, a frequent approach is to let them explore the content freely. We want them to feel immersed. We want them to play like they're at home. Uh, this was also very different from traditional tests in that it was one-on-one. -on -one. So us moderators, we oftentimes watch three or four players at a time. We're able to get enough observations from all of them. But by doing it one-on-one, -on -one, this allowed us to build a rapport and to understand our players as well as the relationships that they have with, with the disabilities that they identified as having. You know, there were also uh, time uh, time slots for uh, for doing like options menu tasks. So we had them think aloud. We had them describe what they were understanding as they went through the options, what they expected them to do. Uh, and then we also had the latter portion of the overall test focusing on missions of concern. So in our moderation guide, it had detail of, oh, this mission requires horseback riding, or this mission is going to have a lot of enemies and we want to see how overwhelming that is. It just gave us a heads up of what to expect, what to look out for to see if uh, disabled players were able to manage that content all right. And for anything that we didn't fully understand, we did have reg regularly scheduled interviews with our players uh, just to clarify any observations. And we had a variety of, of really interesting players. You know, one of our players was one-handed and they did not use the one-handed mode. They uh, they actually, I think they, they remapped a button to the other hand and then contr uh, controlled one of the sticks with their chin. Um, and that, that, that player played the game so skillfully, it was like, it was so cool to see that uh, they weren't experiencing any major barriers in play. We also had uh, one other player who was kind of in denial about needing to use the, the options in the visual menu. And like, like we knew in theory that that was something we could come across, but it was really interesting to come across it the first time. Um, and it's very tricky for a moderator because uh, they cannot tell the player what to do. You know, we we can sort of maybe if they if they struggle with an area long enough, we can sort of nudge them in the right in, in the in not the right direction, but in like a closer direction that's more comfortable for them. And so eventually the moderator did succeed. You know, they were able to have that player try some options in the menu and that player was no longer, you know, uh, falling off ledges as much as they used to. And they were able to see certain things in the world. And so this is what it is when you recruit for barriers instead of specific disabilities. Here we have a player who maybe did not, maybe would not have identified as having a certain, uh, a certain uh, disability when it comes to vision, but because they were very honest about the barriers that they were experiencing, we were able to actually have them for a test when we otherwise might have accidentally overlooked them. 
I myself had a had a wonderful participant who, for example, you know, they turned on holdless mode at the very beginning of the game. And then the very first decision in the game was selecting Danny's gender. So you had to hold a button to select that. So it's like right away we were uncovering all sorts of wonderful of wonderful insights. It, it was it was a really rewarding experience. Okay, so I could have made a whole game show of this accessibility or usability. Here's an example type of observation we might have had. A player has died six times during a mission and we already know they are experienced with first person shooters. So there's various ways of interpreting this. If this were a test with non-disabled players, we'd be thinking about, hmm, there's some, maybe there's some sort of disconnect with the, with the usability of the game, the way that the player is able to interact with it. Um, or, you know, we could ask ourselves questions like, is there an unintended difficulty spike happening here? Or um, does the player have the suitable weapons, gear, et cetera, that we would expect them to have at this point in the game? But now that it's an accessibility test, we have to look at it differently. Are the active accessibility features working as intended? Or can the players see the enemies against the background, even though there's like this enemy outline? And that was a problem that we encountered. There, there, you know, when you think about the Yara in uniform, this sort of like beigey brown, uh, it really blended in with the dried grass of the landscape. So it was kind of hard for players to make out. And so um, ultimately, uh, we start to recognize that there are different types of issues that arise from gameplay and options barriers. Um, we, we recognize that, okay, some issue that maybe a non-disabled player encounters, maybe it's annoying, maybe it's a little bit frustrating, but those same issues can be very difficult for players with disabilities to, to sort of reckon with. It can, it can be even worse uh, for them. And then there are also going to be uh, issues that are that apply to disabled players like, exclusively, and those need to be uh, they, those need to be addressed in their own way as well. And then, of course, we were clarifying uh, as much as we could within interviews where appropriate. So finally, we look at the data analysis, the reporting part of this. Um, so we understood that the developers needed more specific feedback because this was taking place later in the process. Um, like I've mentioned before, this was a validation process. We wanted to make sure that things work. Um, and the way that we describe um, the way that we describe things to the team is we have a standard description of issues. You know, we, we are explaining what exactly is, is happening in this issue. We explain the cause, if we know it, um, and then we explain the consequences or the effect on the player experience. And by all means, we were not doing this alone. Again, we had our accessibility team. They were there ensuring the feedback was uh, actionable, that it was accurate. They're checking our interpretations of the data and contextualizing the experiences uh, that we observed. Um, they're making sure we're not duplicating anything that was already given to the team and making sure the consistency of wording is good and other details like that. We also have a standard post-test meeting. We reflect on the entire process uh, and, and think about what to improve for next time. So this was really good between our first accessibility test and our second. So finally, I want to leave you with some key takeaways. Number one, just start learning. It doesn't have to be scary. You have to forget what you think you already know about accessibility and be self-compassionate as you reprogram your understanding of people with disabilities. You know, from our experience, uh, they're very understanding of our mistakes as long as we're trying. Number two, uh, testing accessibility early allows for creating possible design solutions. Testing later mostly provides validation for what works and what doesn't. You know, if I have to be honest, Far Cry 6 is not a fully accessible game, but we did the best that we could within our time frame, and we always wish we could have started much earlier. But, you know, this is, this is what we have learned for next time. Number three, recruit early with interpreters if necessary. Um, like I said, you need to plan for a month or so. You are drawing upon a smaller pool of players overall, and you're coordinating with more people from caregivers to interpreters, possibly other third parties. Uh, you need to be ready for that. Number four, everything apart from the game being tested needs to be accessible too. So again, the non-disclosure agreements, reward forms, welcome presentation, it's gotta be friendly to screen readers, high contrast with clear text. 
Number five, take the time to do technical setups and pilot testing. The advantage of remote testing is we have access to many more players, definitely the silver lining of this experience. There are infinite possible setups though as a result and you have to get ready for them. Number six, take steps to accommodate both the players and staff. Again, we have those check-in processes. We had a one-on-one -on -one approach between the player and the moderator. We had frequent breaks and the guide for us was very clear to reduce the stress and that sort of cognitive load, the number of things that we had to keep track of in our minds. Number seven, work to understand the nuance between usability and accessibility. This is something that's gonna happen over time as you become more experienced. And number eight, document everything, really. You need to work with your team to build a, an accessibility guide. You know, even if you're not a researcher, there are different ways that it could apply to your field. You know, for example, let's say HR hiring processes. You know, what are you doing to accommodate people going in? Is their workplace in need of different sorts of accommodations? You know, things like that. It has to be offered to everyone. Um, focus on continuous improvement uh, and make sure that it's tailored to your department. So again, with that HR example, um, we're very, very fortunate at Ubisoft to have an in-house team that can look such, you know, documentation over and give us tips. And maybe you're watching this and you're working with experts outside of your organization. Or maybe you're on a small team or maybe you're a solo developer and you're trying to make your game more accessible, which is freaking awesome. Just make sure that you're writing things down, consult with disabled players along the way to start. And then once you have the means, you can work your way to establishing these meaningful relationships with experts. We'll make sure you're on the right track. Also, I have a few wishes uh, on how to sustain the momentum. I hope that we can continue to have a strong relationship with our accessibility team. And in retrospect, uh, we should have had much more contact with them than we did. Uh, we didn't talk to them as much as we possibly could have, including, you know, we should have had them at our post-test meeting, but we didn't. Um, but there were just time restraints on everyone. And so we could have, uh, we could have made use of this incredible resource much more. Also, I think it would be great if we broaden our knowledge about game design and development. You know, if we as researchers have a better understanding of the production's different design goals, the different stages, we can take the opportunity to do things like draw awareness to different types of content that need testing at different times. I would love it if we continue to involve more casual players and fewer like you know hardcore power users, if you will. Um, we have a habit of recruiting players that have played the previous installment of a franchise or they've put in a lot of hours and that's essential to our research but it's not all encompassing and I think about that player we sent home you know they're a Far Cry fan they said they were going to buy the game even though they couldn't play in our test and that makes that makes us wonder you know how would they have played Far Cry 6 at home how did they even play the previous ones you know we, we can't know at this time and that's potentially a lost opportunity and finally, we need to think about how to mature our process. You know, so this time it did make sense to test with players with disabilities um, because it, we needed to validate the options, we needed to validate the gameplay design. But is there a better approach? You know, I, I honestly don't know. Um, but I know that game accessibility won't be solved with menus alone, uh, and we're gonna need more clever design solutions as we go. So I trust all of you watching to please keep coming up with your amazing ideas, your badass solutions, and we will be waiting to test them. Thank you so, so much for your time. You can reach out to me on Twitter, AJM Pepin, or you might be able to catch me on Discord. Take good care. I absolutely love that talk, and especially in partnership with the QA talk that we had today. Um, you know, it was highlighted that it takes so many different groups to be able to do accessibility and make sure that you're doing it well. And there were so many great lessons, even just from the beginning. Ashley was sharing, you know, just to be curious is the first step and to just start learning and it doesn't have to be scary that's the next talk but really i love this idea of being compassionate to yourself when going on this journey and of course one thing i do want to plug is 
uh, playtest.ubisoft.com where you can sign up to be a future part of Ubisoft titles. I mean, again, so many great things to highlight in terms of um, doing recruitment by barrier. Um, and I believe it was Navi that said in chat, it's also just so much more respectful and accurate. Lots of people experience barriers to access without specific diagnoses. Of course, you know, be sure to partner <laughs> with your legal team so you don't uh, mess anything up. And, you know, you can use user research in so many different stages. Like Ashley said, whether you're validating an idea or doing research to come up with, with things early. So, um, so much information there that was just amazing. So we're gonna be taking a short talk about four minutes and then we will be back for the last talk of the day. And I'm a little partial to it. So I hope you stick around. All right, and here we are 
at the final talk of the day. Accessible horror. Everyone is entitled to one good scare. Due to their interactive nature, video games are an amazing way to give someone a good scare. However, video game horror tropes are frequently inaccessible, leaving people more disappointed than frightened. Dim the lights, put on your blanket, because in this talk, horror fans and accessibility advocates will revisit the rich history of horror media, break down how games try to scare people, and how some people are being left out of the fun. Plus, how to instill a sense of dread within alternative, accessible, and spooky methods. I am very excited about this, and I hope you guys have a ton of fun watching it. Welcome everyone, and we are going to be talking today about accessible horror. Everyone is entitled to one good scare for this year's GA Conference 2021. My name is Morgan, and I'm going to go ahead and let the two other lovely ladies introduce themselves today. Hi everyone, I'm Tara Velker, but you've probably already seen me because I'm the co-conspirator of this conference. When I'm not here being your favorite host, uh, I'm actually working over at Xbox Studios, helping uh, lead our accessibility. And today I'm gonna to be telling you about some of the tropes that we see in horror games that leave some people out on the scares. Hi, my name is Amé, Amy, Amélian. I go by many names, but I'm very French. So use what you're comfortable with. <laughs> I am the accessibility lead for Square Enix West. And today I'm going to be talking about the history of horror media and accessibility in the genre. And then lastly, I am Morgan Baker and I'm an accessibility lead and game designer for The Odd Gentleman. And today I'm gonna to be talking about best practices for accessibility in the horror genre. So let's just dive straight into it. Hello everyone and welcome to this part of the talk which is called the history of horror media from silent films to books to modern cinema and games. I am a mate or Emilian and I'm here to tell you all about it. But before we start, I do want to give a quick disclaimer. Um, my slides tend to be a little bit text heavy. Um, that's just to ensure that I respect the allocated time that we each have for our parts. Um, but feel free to read or listen to me if you prefer. And we also will make these slides available after um, the talk. So do not worry if you miss anything. Uh, those slides will be available after the talk. So let's start at the beginning. <laughs> um, there is a variety of different approaches uh, when we want to induce fear, right? So all of these different approaches still have one intent uh, to scare us. We can look at books, for example, you know, like Stephen King or, you know, uh, here we have Tenerife Dew uh, and different you know horror books that uh you know come in different shapes and form uh when it comes to their stories and the type of characters that they portray um some of them are made for younger audiences like goosebumps um or some of them are made for a more older audiences and um they all kind of use different approaches obviously when it comes to storytelling but they all use storytelling and efficient writing to induce fear anxiety and make us imagine our own worst nightmares because when it comes to novels for example um contrary to comics for example um we don't have imagery to support what we're reading so everything happens in our heads and that can be very terrifying um tv and cinema also uses the power of storytelling obviously but now we have more layers more added layers we now have images sounds and acting performances which can really 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 uh, uh drive <laughs> you know the goal home when it comes to inducing fear in its audiences we have um movies that are silent as well and we're gonna get into that just a little bit in, in a little bit but um you know movies are a very very powerful way to uh you know create horror content and we've seen a variety of different uh, uh types of horror you know and types of stories it can be monsters gory uh psychological thrillers and different types of horror that will go and tap into that fear of ours in different ways 
And again, same thing for video games. Uh, it uses all of the above storytelling images, um, sounds, um, acting performances. In many ways here, it's more voice acting performances. Um, but now there's a, a little bit uh, of a difference and that the direct interaction that the user can have with uh, your experience. So that adds a whole other level of immersion that the other mediums uh, may not have. Um, and that can make your experience way scarier. So now, like I said, if we just go back a couple years to now <laughs> what feels like a lifetime ago, um, we have the era of silent films, uh, which is oftentimes considered the golden era in the cultural history of the, Amer of the American deaf community. Um, the only reason why I'm focusing on that right now is just because, well, we don't have a, a lot of time <laughs> today to cover uh, the entire history of horror media. Um, but um, I did want to touch upon that because it is one of the most obvious um, places that we can point at when it comes to a cultural shift in uh, horror culture. Because in the past with uh, silent films, um, we were using intertitles, sometimes called um, title cards in order to convey um, character dialogue, obviously. And there were no spoken words. And so that made it a, an experience that was quite accessible um, to deaf people because they could go to the cinema and uh, experience a very similar type of experience as any other of the theater goers at the time. Unfortunately, bye bye inter <laughs> titles because uh, when talkies arrived, talkies being uh, sound films, um, these title cards started to become more and more rare and nowadays we barely see any at all. Um, and, you know, when it comes to sound films, we've grown to love and hate them. And obviously there's been different approaches to try and make those more accessible. But overall speaking, you know, these experiences in themselves are oftentimes not very accessible. Um, and that goes for, uh, you know, movies and games um, alike and any other type of, you know, uh, horror content that does contain um, sounds uh, uh, on the screen, whether it be through dialogue or um, uh, sound effects, uh, ambience, music, uh, etc. Over the years, you know, there's been still different approaches to try and re-embrace um, live dialogue movies. Um, silent movies, movies themselves are extremely rare nowadays, but we have seen movies that have tried to limit dialogue as much as possible. Um, like in Drive, for example, Ryan Gosling speaks a total of 891 words in the movie. Um, and that's not a lot. And so that's interesting to see because, you know, a lot of movies don't necessarily dare to do that because, you know, we've been, we're used to the new tactics, the new practices, but it doesn't mean that you can't explore what the past has done for us. And, you know, the past has built very strong foundation uh, when it comes to horror media. So definitely go check that out uh, if you're doing research about making your own um, horror experience. Um, films like A Quiet Place as well are very light in dialogue um, and also represent um, a deaf actress. Um, and, you know, so there are places that you can look into how to make things differently. Um, so I invite you to do your homework and go and dig into the past of horror media because there is a very, very, very rich uh, database of um, movies, uh, games, uh, books, uh, even theater uh, pieces that you can look into. And I definitely invite you to do that. And we're not going to get into that today per se. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to movies because we're trying to focus on video games but I did want to touch upon it because I think that's very important and also relevant to whenever you're making these stories for your games and casting also your voice actors and also making characters um, in, in, your, in your game is the representation <laughs> that occurs um, in horror films, TV and that's worth a whole other talk, honestly, but just very quickly uh, to say, uh, when it comes to representation, obviously there is a big problem in Hollywood and elsewhere <laughs> where, uh, you know, people who are playing uh, disabled characters, for example, are not people who are disabled, in, you know, in real life. Um, and that is an issue because there is a plethora of disabled talents that are there and available <laughs> to work and they're not being hired because uh, people who are all either already known in Hollywood are being prioritized over them or people who 
are non-disabled are prioritized just because uh, there is this myth that it can be harder to work with a disabled actor or talent um, or that it's more expensive or you know that it, it's it's it has it has a whole layer of, a, of complexity to making a, a piece of a piece of content um, which is all just BS, pardon, pardon my French, um, but yeah, definitely take the time to, if you're gonna be, you know, making disabled um, characters and try to, you know, have a message of inclusion, uh, when, whether it be disability um, or, you know, sexual orientation or, you know, including people of color, you know, LGBTQ plus community, make sure that you go and talk to these communities before, you know, building a whole story based on, you know, what you assume, you know, uh, uh, these communities go through or how they, you know, live their lives and how they talk and how they express themselves. It's very important and not just have consultants, but also make sure that if you're going to have a disabled character, cast a disabled actor that can really, you know, push that performance to its best, honestly. So this slide will be available afterwards if you want to read it but yeah there's a bunch of you know horror movies and tv um that do this you know sometimes both right and wrong in the same you know piece of horror sometimes there's some wins sometimes there's some losses there and some fails but ultimately again if you do your homework you will find a plethora of information when it comes to representation um in uh horror media so uh now that feels a little overwhelming and you might be left with a couple of different questions like so are sound films automatically scarier than silent films are video games automatically scarier than movies overall and are movies automatically scarier than books ah well no <laughs> that's the short answer the long answer is that it's complicated um you know obviously you can create fear in so many ways uh, sometimes it's the unknown that induces fear sometimes it's guts and blood and sometimes it's you know a scary monster sometimes it's jump scares and creepy music or you know sometimes it's like a creepy voice for example and <laughs> it's weird it's back okay my bad <laughs> i apologize um and sometimes it's a still image of a long empty dark hallway that will haunt us so that may all sound scary no pun intended but making a scary horror experience you know even though it can feel complex and, and it is like in like making any other type of you know uh media whether it be a movie or a video game it is so worth it uh, horror is one of the most impactful, lasting, and powerful subgenre of entertainment, and it has also one of the most active and loyal community hashtag horrorfam in pop culture. It is the subject of so many studies on culture, psychology, and media. We often love it <laughs> when it's bad, <laughs> even, so don't be afraid to dare because, worst case, you can become a meme. <laughs> I'm sure that many of you can hear that, that quote in your head. So here are some quick takeaways, um, you know, from this part of the talk. So regardless of the media, not one piece of horror does it the same. The, har the, ar the art, my apologies, of scaring someone comes in many different forms. And it's been forever evolving over the course of history. That being said, um, terror knows no era nor bounds. So definitely don't hesitate to go dig back way back and kind of like use all the information you know throughout history to um you know do your research when you're creating a, a piece of horror content because there it, this is it's so rich and it's so important um scaring people is not easy and you know we acknowledge that um but it is also one of the richest opportunity to try different approaches because you know uh, this is where accessibility comes into play and it is one of the perfect mindset towards innovation and standing out as a creator. So don't fall into tired tropes, dare to try and make a, a piece of, you know, accessible horror um, content really and you you won't regret it. So right before we leave, I just wanted to say thank you for... Um, Okay, um, I'll be I'll be right back, um, Tara. If you can just you know if you can just uh, cut that, I'll just restart the ending at the end. Okay. I'm Ame. Walks off screen.
Ame's hand hits the floor in the background and then is dragged off screen. Ame! Hey, Ame! Well, that's weird. Um, anyway, I, I guess I'll continue with my section. So, now we've learned a little bit about the history of sort of the horror genre in general, I'm going to talk specifically about some of the inaccessible tropes that we see time and time again in horror games. And I want to be clear here. I'm going to pick these games apart because I love them dearly. I know what these tropes are because I play horror games all the time. And the reason that I'm doing this, the reason that we're having this talk is because we love the genre and we want to be able to bring it to more people. And I cannot stress, I love horror games. That's why we're doing this. But horror games aren't perfect. They make mistakes. Let's set the scene here. You're walking down a, down a dark, dark hallway. And then suddenly you hear behind you, a telephone. It's ringing. You turn around slowly. You walk forward and you pick it up. And a story advances. What game is that from? Well, actually, that's from like a million different horror games. And to provide some specific examples, it's you in Resident Evil Village. It's you in PT. It's you in The Medium. It's you in literally so many horror games. I could probably make just a talk on horror video games that feature phones ringing but don't have any visual indicators. It's a big problem in horror. And honestly, sound-based cues in general are a big deal in horror games. And they're frequently informing players where they need to go next to advance the story. But we're really seeing the same things over and over that aren't really being captured in any way. Obviously, and I'm not, I'm going to keep stressing this, the first binging, being ringing telephones. But other circumstances, and one I see all the time, are doors locking or unlocking frequently behind you. Think about it. You're in a game, you solve some intricate puzzle, and then somewhere behind you, a door has unlocked, a cabinet has opened, something. But there's only an audio cue. And if you don't see it, then like, don't hear it and you don't see it, you don't know that it's happened. But there's also frequently things that are supposed to draw your attention to some place that you don't know about. A loud crash or bang, again, that you're supposed to hear and then follow to advance the story. But if you're hard of hearing or deaf, you may not know about it. But really, I mean, we can go beyond, beyond just story advancing sound cues to talk about sounds in general. I mean, while we're on the topic, mood setting is obviously a huge part, but there's more than just that. A lot of horror games specifically have proximity monitors about how close you are to baddies, and they're using audio for it. You can think back to the first Silent Hill game, the radio would go off when you were near baddies. Radio. What's going on with that radio? But even in modern games like Dead by Daylight, you hear the heartbeat when you're close to the killer. But if you can't hear that heartbeat... But honestly, there are so many warnings, sometimes literal audio warnings about things that are happening. Like maybe you're on a space station and losing oxygen for decompression that people don't have any information on. You know, and the number of times there's something around the corner or around the door or through that hallway that you're getting ready to go through. That as a hearing person, I know there's something scary right over there. But, you know, it's not frequently shown in an accessible manner, which sucks. But one of my favorite things about horror game is the world building. They have such rich lore, feeling, atmosphere, and that's what draws so many people in. And I think that's why in horror games you see so many things that provide more information from audio logs to diaries to medical journals to occasionally the message 
scrawled in blood on the wall. But those are also frequently inaccessible. They can be really, really hard to read. And it sucks when that happens because if you can't read the blood on the wall that says cut off their limbs, you may not immediately know how to kill those aliens in dead space. Sometimes they're clues to puzzles, sometimes they're information on the characters, but when they are put in these low contrast environments with these weird fonts in a way that you can't quite get a good look at, people can really lose out. They just can't read what it says, which again, they're amazing in terms of the world building, so it sucks when people get left out. And I want to say that the worst example, um, but what I love, is whenever you're doing any sort of gothic horror that has a diary with beautiful cursive handwriting, that, I mean, honestly, even a lot of kids today never learned cursive. It just sucks that they can't get into that. But you know what sucks more? Insta-death. One of the things that horror games are great at are giving you this panic, and that's the experience you're signing up for. But sometimes that panic can really end up setting you up for failure, and you'll have to retry things. So a lot of horror games have QTEs, quick time events, where you very quickly have to make a split second decision. And if you mess up, well then you're dead. And depending on the game, it can mean you've lost a massive chunk of progress and you have to replay. Or for games that you make wrong choices in, especially if you have to read, it gets compounded. So let's say that perhaps you have a prompt on screen that you're reading and you have to respond quickly. Well, if you're dyslexic, you may have messed that up and now you've made the wrong choice and now you're dead. And that was it, really quickly, before you even had time to process what was happening. And of course, one of the things that we love about horror games are the big baddies. And the biggest baddies, ugh, you gotta be careful. Because if they get you, you're dead. But you know what sucks? Replaying that same fight over and over because you just really suck at dodging that massive hammer he's throwing at your head. Or maybe it's a chainsaw to your neck. Either way, it's progress lost. And you have to do it again. And when you repeat it, it loses its fun. And one of the things that, again, are all about atmosphere and world building in horror games are these visuals, which are frequently full of fog and darkness and extreme shadows. And they are beautiful, but it can make the environment harder to navigate. It can make it so that you miss key elements or in terms of having things that you can interact with, you may literally not be able to locate those items because they're blending into the world and they don't have contrast. There's nothing worse than circling the same room six times because you missed that little prompt that said that you were supposed to pick up this necklace that goes in this jewelry box. Again, beautiful, they set the scene, but if you can't play it, does it really matter? how beautiful and creepy your fog is? Probably not, because if I have to keep walking around in it, it'll eventually lose its luster anyway. And all of these things really do come together in what can be a massive sensory overload for players. First off, you're scared when you're playing horror games. That's on purpose, that's the challenge. But I think we all know that everything gets harder when you're scared. And it's something that was difficult is now more difficult. And on top of the anxiety that you're experiencing, you're probably having flashing lights, enemies, you're managing your weapons, your ammo, and sometimes the UI even gets more complex as you're playing the game or you're reducing your field of vision because you've been hurt. And that really can overload players. It's something that happens all the time in horror games, unfortunately. And really, the last thing is uh, not even a trope we're going to address here today, but, you know, don't even get me started on the representation- <laughs> Oh, well, that's weird. Huh. I- I'm gonna go see what's setting off my Sam. Hold on. Tara gets up Hello? and walks out of the room. Hello?
Wait, did y'all hear something? Anyway, now we've learned a bunch about the genre of horror as well as how horror games can be inaccessible. So what do we do about it? And don't worry, witches, I got you. What do we do first about insta-death? Well, we can limit or even remove it. QTEs, make them optional in your settings. If someone picks the wrong choice, oh, let them try again without any sort of major repercussions. Dying to the same boss over and over again because it's ridiculously difficult, just let players change the difficulty or better yet, bypass. Losing progress to often put in frequent checkpoints and let players manually save. Let's take the dark pictures. The game offers holdable QTEs and no-fail options, making the gameplay more accessible to a wider range of players. Streamer Paige Artemis Harvey brings light to this feature with the quote, With holdable QTEs and no-fail options, you've made this disabled horror lover so, so happy. <laughs> Hooray for no more button mashing, I just love to see that. And speaking of button mashing, Dead, for day or dead by Daylight, I cannot say it. Uh, recently added a button mashing replacement, one of the most highly requested features within this game. Rather than mashing buttons to escape, players can now do a simple skill check, which becomes kind of progressively harder every single time. The developer notes in the quote, the goal isn't to make struggling harder or make you get sacrificed faster, it's just to make it easier on your fingers, and players were thrilled by the options. And though this game was released in 2016, this feature was added in April of 2021, proving that it is never too late to add accessibility to your game, even in the horror genre. Shifting over, we can add more modes within the game options menu itself. Yes, we can let players like adjust the difficulty, uh, but we can also go a little bit deeper than that. For example, we can add modes to reduce sudden scares or assist modes or apply filters such as a profanity, nudity, or gore filter. The game Trenches actually offers a no jump scare mode, seen in the title menu as the second option circled on the sides. <laughs> How cool is that? You can also take the game Soma, like S-O-M-A. On the left, the game mode is set to normal, where monsters are dangerous and can kill you, but on the right, you can change the game to safe, which still makes the games super creepy. The monsters are very terrifying looking, but they can't kill you anymore. And it's really nice because the game is very much narrative driven, so you can still play the game if stealth is a barrier for you. As Tara mentioned, it's also pretty common to see horror games without subtitles or closed captions, or rather, proper ones, that is. Captions and subtitles should be short and to the point and display at the right time. I cannot tell you how many moments where, like, it's completely ruined for me because the caption comes up before the actual sound happens. Like someone wants to do a surprise stabby stabby, well, if the caption happens before it, it kind of takes the fun out of it. They should also have the captions be appropriate, meaning captions should only include pertinent gameplay, which yes, this does include atmosphere and caption audio cues, such as please caption the telephones. I'm deaf, I don't know if the phone is ringing, so please caption it, help, help a girl out. And most importantly, give players the options to customize the captions, which is extremely important, especially for the horror genre. As designers, though, rather than subtitling everything, we can also use visuals to our advantage. Because, let's be honest, sometimes sound is just a mess, y'all. This can come in a number of forms, whether it's like UI UX, HUD, all the way to messing with the environment, such as like lighting and moving objects. For example, going back to the phone, uh, sure, yes, please caption it please. But if the timing is supposed to be sudden or jarring, you can flicker all the lights except for the one over the phone or just flicker the light over the phone or have the phone shake in front of the player so it's whoa, whoa, a sudden movement that's spooky. It makes the gameplay not only more accessible but also more interesting for those who may not be using audio. And you can still call upon classic horror to make this really good as Ame has previously referenced. However, you still want to make sure that sound is still there. In fact, consistent sound is the key for many players, especially those with vision disabilities or those who require multiple modalities. So please use sound design still, it's very important. 
But what do we do about sensory overload? Well, we give players the control, let them pause without repercussions, let them adjust the brightness, let them reduce the number of players or enemies, or make them easier, give weapon options and let them change the UI, let them adjust the volume with separate sliders, and the list goes on forever. The idea is though, is letting players essentially customize things can reduce sensory overload in the long run. But you can also too think about it and bake it in as well, making sure that you don't do things, for example, sudden flashing that could cause something like a uh, seizure, which is just not good in general for any game. Let's take the game Horror Tales The Wine. Players can change the size of all in-game text with a sire and select between a number of eight different styles ranging from different colors and backgrounds for the actual text. I mean, just look at this text on the screen. It is massive, it is beautiful, it is a masterpiece, and you can make it way bigger than this in the game as well. Tara also brought up creepy writing on the walls that can sometimes be illegible. You don't need to necessarily remove this from your game, but instead you can provide an accessible way to essentially read it. For example, in Resident Evil Village, they do this in two forms. The first, as currently displayed on the screen, is it'll show the text in a legible font right underneath the nose. So you can still read on here, February 2nd, 2021, Rose's half birthday. But the second way they do it as well is players can open up a text box and to essentially read it with ease and efficiency. Here there is a note on a fridge and players are being asked to press A or F to examine it. And if they press F, boom! Now all of a sudden we get a nice little text box with legible writing. Um, it's a list of groceries, which I guess that makes sense to put that on a refrigerator. Other visual barriers include lights, shadows, and colors, and we want to make sure that players can increase the brightness, but also turn off certain effects that might obscure vision, for example, let them turn off fog or rain effects, and let them change the saturation, the gamma, the gain, the contrast, it won't take away from the game. I super pinky swear that this is very helpful for the horror genre. Horror Tales The Wine once again takes it a step further by adding outlines to pertinent gameplay objects to essentially improve visibility. Here we have a close-up of a broken wine bottle uh, with a nice kind of blue highlight outline so you can see it better in the current broad daylight setting. And here we see again it's in a darker space and the wine bottle is far away and in kind of like a creepy dark cellar, uh, but we still have these very thick blue outlines that are glowing so you can spot the object. It's super clear and it contrasts very well. But if a player needs a hint or if they get lost, what do we do? Help them. <laughs> Take Dead Space, for example, which implements something called deck nav. Uh, you basically hit the right analog stick and a blue line appears showing you the location of the next objective. And though the game is mostly linear, you can actually set objectives to have a little bit more control over this. And don't forget, it's never too late to add accessibility. Dead Space is coming out with a remake, actually, and the devs are going out of their way to add way more accessibility and kind of bake it in or add it as options. The creative director actually notes here, all those elements of accessibility will definitely be something important for us in terms of opening the Dead Space experience to a broader set of people that didn't necessarily have the opportunity or could play the game when it came out. Well, everyone, there you have it. Don't forget to bake in the accessibility, add options, and most importantly, please caption your telephones. <laughs> Why are the lights flashing? Do you hear anything? Where's this? Where's the captions? Make horror games accessible. If you don't, someone might come for you. And you won't like that. <laughs> you can find Ame, Morgan, and Tara 
or at least what's left of them, on Twitter, at the Slasher Chick, Momox Mia, and Lady O'Pair. Special thanks to Paul Stockman, the first cinematic zombie to act of its own free will, and Dean and Stad. I was going to try to hide from the camera and like come back up, but you could see me, which means that didn't really work that well. So um, that was really one of the funnest talks that I've ever got to make. And really for me, um, you know, I, I said it on Twitter, but, you know, sometimes, especially in accessibility, it's really uh, easy to feel like you're on the, the edge of being burnt out. And this talk, you know, brought it back for me. So uh, I want to say thank you so much for coming to this first cat, <laughs> the purse in my face, um, to, to the first day of Game Accessibility Conference. We will be back tomorrow. I want to, of course, say thank you to um, our lovely interpreters that we had today. Um, right now we've had Jenny and Rick and, oh my goodness, what was... Um, I was, I forgot her, this, the name from this morning. I will post it in the Discord um, and we will again thank uh, her tomorrow as well. Um, thank you to uh, Lindsay for being our captioner as always. And Brooke, thank you, Rick. Um, uh, and thank you to our sponsors for everything that they have done for us. And with that, um, oh my God, Kat. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, to I want to say thank you to all of the speakers who have gone today. You did great work, and I can't wait to see you guys again tomorrow morning as we kick off day two. I hope you have a great rest of your evening if you're here in North America, or you have a great morning <laughs> if you're uh, over in Europe. Uh, thank you so much, and again, 